Welcome back to He's a Giant, a pod about all things college football and all things Giants football. I'm your host, Sal. A little bit late. I apologize to my HR <laughs> representatives. And here with my co-host, Monty. What's up, brother? What's going on, Sal? Yeah, man. It was a busy week in Giants world. So uh be a lot to talk about today. Uh, how'd you how'd you feel about everything so far? I was a little busy today, as you know, and I was a little AWOL for a couple of weeks. So I apologize to our loyal viewers. I had a few things going on. Monty was kind enough and strong enough to hold it down without me. Um, so we appreciate you guys being back. Um, but getting to the Giants, man, um, some fun news going on. Uh, so we'll get into it in a second. I just wanted to intro our, our live audience, what we're going to be going through today. So we're going through some stuff, some updates in free agency and Giants offseason stuff that's developing as we speak. And we're going to do a little bit of a combine breakdown, just a quick review of what happened, risers, fallers, things to look at. Um, so we're going to go through all that stuff. But let's get into the the big thing today. So the Giants yesterday signed their new backup quarterback, I thought, Drew Locke. Let's get right into it, man. So Drew Locke signs the Giants, uh, one year, $5 million, a sort of eh, middle of the road deal. So it doesn't really pl- show their hand as to whether or not they plan on taking a quarterback based on that alone. Wasn't so expensive that they wouldn't. Wasn't so cheap that you know that they definitely have to. He's a decent quarterback who would fit what Brian Dable likes to do. He's got a big live arm. He's big. He's stupid. He makes dumb mistakes and he can run. So he seems to be what what Dable likes. Um, but we just got word from uh, actually, I guess Dan Duggan was the first one to report it that John Schneider, the GM of the Seahawks, essentially, and I have to pull up the the, tw- the tweet, uh, the quote, but he basically said that. They wanted to retain Drew Locke in Seattle, tried very hard to, but that Drew Locke was swayed to the Giants because he was offered an opportunity, a legitimate opportunity to be the starting quarterback of the Giants this season. So, what do you think? Interesting, man. It doesn't surprise me at all, honestly. It was surprising me that it was said that John Snyder just went out and outed the Giants like that, but it doesn't surprise me. I mean, we heard that we were interested in Russell Wilson. We brought him in. We didn't, like, as much as people wanted to try to play it down and not talk to Russell Wilson for him to be a backup. Russell Wilson was never going to come here to be a backup. If they got Russell Wilson, he was at least, least going to start off the season. Um, yeah. I think I, I don't think that's necessarily the case with Drew Locke. I don't think Drew Locke is, like, set into the starter by any means, but... I think that you know indicated that you know the Rich Eisen thing that you know they're they're they are not tied to Daniel Jones. If if Drew Locke comes in here and wins the quarterback job, they're gonna give Drew Locke the job. I don't know if he will or he won't win that job, but yeah, it's pretty clear that that they are ready to move on from Daniel. Yeah, it seems pretty obvious that they're going to be ready to move on from Daniel Jones pretty quickly now. Um, I mean, it's one thing. I mean, Russell Wilson is one thing, right? The guy's a Hall of Famer, uh, and he won a Super Bowl, been to two. Uh, he's had an amazing career and just a terrible spot in Denver the last couple of years. But, I mean, Drew Locke? Drew Locke to be the starter? I mean, Drew Locke was a horrendous starter in Denver, and he got traded, and he's been – a little bit better, I guess, in his limited action in Seattle. And I like, you know, we like what we see from him. He's got a big arm and he can do some nice things. He definitely cooked the Eagles and James Bradbury. That was fun to watch. Um, but, and he beat us. I mean, he had that one drive against us where he, where he drove the, the Seahawks down the field. But for him to be told, hey, you're, you've got a legitimate shot to be the starting quarterback, that tells me their, their bar is low. Their bar is real low right now. And that does not bode well for Daniel Jones. So do you think that's more... Do you think that's more Drew Locke um, and the Giants just saying, hey, we just want to have some competition for Jones? Or do you think that's more uh, we're done with Jones completely and Drew Locke is here to to just sort of hold it down and compete with the rookie? What's your interpretation of that? I think they are – I think I would lean to their done with Jones side. Like, I don't think – like, I mean, obviously, I think Drew Locke's going to win this job. I think we draft a rookie. They have to win this job. But I think there's two aspects this year. One that we've talked about before, and that's the injury guarantee. Um, If Daniel Jones gets hurt and he can't pass his physical by, you know, about a year from now, then we're going to have to pay $23 million guaranteed or hold on to him till he can pass the physical and pay the, 
whatever $15 million guaranteed that we owe them at the beginning of next league year. So that's one part of it. And the other part of it is, look, I just think we have enough of a sample size where Daniel Jones knows that, like, or sorry, Brian Dable knows that Daniel Jones isn't just not operating the offense the way he wants to. He, he's given them multiple opportunities to open this all up. And whether he's unwilling to or unable to, he hasn't done it. And it's, you know, he's done it with two different teams. He's done it when he's had, you know, the line supporting him in 2022. And he still didn't open up the offense. They gave him weapons in 2023. He still didn't open up the offense. And then we saw a guy in Tyra Taylor work in the same offense and it totally opened up. I think, you know, Drew Locke is a worse player in Tyra Taylor, but I do think at this point, you know, even like Tommy DeVito, who was really a bad quarterback, showed some signs of throwing the ball downfield. So I I think it's I think it's a two two parts there. Yeah. No, I, I think they're done. I mean there's a lot of news coming out. Now that doesn't mean they're they're gonna take a quarterback. I think there's that's two separate issues, right? Being done with Jones and taking a quarterback are not the same thing. Because you can easily be done with Jones and say, we don't want to let this guy on the field again because he sucks or we don't want to hit the injury to guarantee. Um, but that's a that's different than, hey, we're walking into this draft class and we're definitely going to take a quarterback. So I'm not sure the two add up, but they probably add up, right? They probably are connected. Um, and I think that kind of leads us into the strategy of what we saw in free agency this week, right? And so I think this is a good time to go into that, but the Giants are pretty active. And at the start of free agency. So, um, you know, in summary, just everybody knows by now. Um, oh, we have, we have, uh, we have Saquon Barkley's biggest fan in the chat. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to, <laughs> to, to you and everybody else shout, in the chat. Shout out Will. It's, it's Will. It's Will's week at week. Will gets to celebrate all week long. It's, it's his victory week. Uh, so, <laughs> um, so the Giants, you know, the start for you are very active, both in getting and losing players. So departures, you know, the big ones we obviously know. Xavier McKinney went to the Packers for a big deal, four years, $67 million. And Saquon Barkley, obviously, the 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 more uh, meaningful one in terms of the impact on the fan base and what he's meant to the team, went to the Philadelphia Eagles, of all teams, for three years and $38 million. Um, we, why don't we start with those two departures? What's your What's your take on those two? Sure. Um, let me start with Xavier McKinney. Um, look, I it sucks losing Xavier McKinney. We'll you know we'll get into some of the other moves we made that you know made it uh, easier pill to swallow. But um, but you know he's a twenty four year twenty four twenty five year old player. He's he's a very good player. Um, and I think it's a player that the Giants wanted to retain. The thing is, is you know, his, his market got really high and, you know, four years, 67 million. I don't know if they wanted to go up to 16 million, which would have put him in the top five money. And they, they went over that. They, the, the Green Bay Packers went over Jesse Bates money. Um, and the, the report was that they gave him an opp- They gave the Giants an opportunity to match and they chose not to, which I can't blame them for doing. Uh, you no know, shout out Xavier McKinney for doing that. But I, you know, I, I wish him well, um, but it, it's definitely a tough loss there. Um, as far as Saquon Barkley, we've talked about this. We've talked about this a hundred times. We both of us were not in favor of bringing back Saquon Barkley, signing a, a long term extension to a twenty seven year old running back, especially where the place this team was, was not the right move. Um, you know, Saquon bet on himself this year. He got hurt and he still got paid like. A good amount of money. You got the tag money this year, and you got similar offer to what he got la- la- last year. But in return, he turned his back on the New York fan base and went to their their biggest enemy, their biggest rival, the Philadelphia Eagles. And you know, if there is any thought of having a career in New York media after he retires, I I think he just lit lit that on fire. Um, so you know, shout out to him. He, he he's a grown man. You can do whatever you want. I don't care. Doesn't bother me. I I do. I think it's a bad move to sign a 27 year old running back to a long term deal. So I am not mad that the Philadelphia Eagles did it because I think it was a mistake. 
Um, but you know, shout out to them. You know, they 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 can go on with their lives together. I don't care. What what about you? How'd you feel about those two? Uh, so Mc, McKinney was the one I wanted to keep. Obviously, the young rising safety. Um, we had ad nauseum discussions about his value and you know the the importance of keeping a core piece, especially in Shane Bowen's defense. Uh, having a versatile safety like that, but like everybody else, there's a price. You know, there's a price at which it makes sense for where your team is, and there's a price where it doesn't. I, I think the Giants made an honest effort to try to keep him. Um, the deal he got, $17 million a year. Uh, I'm very satisfied that the Giants came away and said, we can't match that. I think that's a lot of money for a safety. I mean, that's top of the market. I think that puts him right in that top five range around Jesse Bates' money, like you said. Um, it's not that he's not a great player. He's a great player, but are the Giants in a position where they should commit that kind of money to a luxury position? I don't know about that. And I, I think that's probably how Joe Shane looked at it too. Like this is a luxury position. It's not a high priority price position. It's kind of like running back. We believe in getting multiple players here. A little too rich, probably. I, I don't know how far they were, but I'm guessing the Giants were probably in that 14 ish million range that they wanted to keep Matt. He got up to 17. Good for him. And there were no hard feelings for McKinney. I think he, he wanted to stay a giant, but that money, you can't blame him for taking that. You can't blame the Giants for saying no, because I was fine with that. With Saquon Barkley, I'll say this. Um, obviously, anybody who knows me knows that I like the player, but I've been I've been very pushing to kind of let him go and let the Giants move on from both him and Daniel Jones since prior to last season. I wanted no part of those two back this year. Nothing personal. I just thought we need, we were not in a position to be making investments in those guys. We needed the rebuild to start, and we didn't need financial assets allocated to those two. They brought him back. It is what it is. People argue. You can argue till your, till your head explodes with me. I'm not going to agree with the position that, oh, you had to do it. I think that's a very weak argument, that you had to do it. Um, I think what you have to do is do what's in the best, best interest of the organization for their, their future at all times. They made a choice, and that's fine. Now... It made no sense to bring Saquon Barkley back. And when people ask me, what would you offer him? I said my offer would be zero. I would not offer him a thing. It makes no sense to bring him back to the Giants. Turns out that was the offer the Giants gave him, if you believe the reports. They did not make an offer to Saquon Barkley at all. They said, go ahead and hit the market. He went to the market. Howie Roseman jumped on it, offered him a lot of money. Giants fans, do, do any one of you think it was a good idea for the Giants to match that amount of money to a 27 year old running back where we are as an organization? No, I don't think anybody would agree with that. Well, maybe some people would, but I know a lot, most of us wouldn't. So at the end of the day, the Giants are right to walk away. Saquon has every right to go wherever he wants to make his money. He doesn't owe this fan base anything. He doesn't owe this organization anything. It's a business. He went and did what's right for his family. But at the end of the day, he's an eagle. He's a division rival. That's that. Goodbye. Hope when you play us, Bobby O'Karake cracks you in half. The end. <clears throat> That's it. Yep. I hope you have. I hope you have a very unsuccessful career. I'm glad you got your money, but now I hope your career tanks and the Eagles tank with you. That's it. How, how I feel about every Eagle, by the way. Mm-hmm. So yep. I'm do, I'm good with it. I think the Giants made the right call on both of these. The McKinney thing hurts a little bit, but not as much as maybe giving 17 million dollars to a non-premium position. You know, and, I think uh, that that's where I stand on that. And we had a comment from Will, and this is something you and I talked about, Sal, while it, in real time that was happening. That really they handled McKinney how they should have handled DJ last year. I think, like, in realistically, we, sh- we should have handled the DJ how we handled McKinney, and we should have handled Saquon how we handled Saquon. I mean, we should have let them hit the market. And if the money was right, then you could. I mean, I could have seen the argument for tagging and trading Saquon, or, or, you know, if, you know, if you had the money, you can tag Saquon. But if you're planning on bringing back Jones, you really didn't have the money, so you know you could rescind it or whatever. Regardless of the Saquon side of things, especially with McKinney, it was you should have let Jones test the market. If the money was right, awesome, you you can bring him back. And if not, I don't want to harp on it too much because it's it's water under the bridge. But I will say this: yeah, to the people who continuously argued, you had to bring them back. You had no choice. You couldn't have sold that to the fan base. How do you think the fan base would have reacted if they just said? We're rebuilding. This was a great year. I'm talking about after 2022. We're rebuilding. We just got out of cap hell. We had a great year. We're not in position to to just offer people money pre-market. We're going to let you guys go, both of you. Just hit the market and just tell them, we would like to bring you back here. But go ahead and hit the market and find out what you you can get, and we'll see if it makes sense. 
my guess is if they hit the market, Saquon Barkley would have gotten a deal. You know, maybe not, maybe something similar to what he got now. You know, I think he's a good enough yeah. player where he would have gotten something like that. Which is like what we're offering him. Which is what we were offering him. And, and maybe we would have taken that. Maybe not. I don't know. I think that would have been a 50 50 proposition. Mm-hmm. I have zero doubt in my mind that Daniel Jones would not have been offered a damn thing, that he would have walked around and gotten offered basically high end backup quarterback money, something akin to what Gardner Minshew just got. Maybe a little more. I don't believe for a second there were teams lining up to pay him. I think everybody in the league knew that he was a product of the system. And I had no doubt in my mind that he was going to get, come back hat in hand to the, to the Giants and say, I'd like to come back here. And he would have signed for half or less than half of what he got, something along those lines. And you would have still gotten the player back for a year or two with less guaranteed money, less of an issue. And, and to be honest, if they got big money and they left, Joe Shane to have turned to the fan base and said, I tried to bring them back. I gave them a chance to come back and build with us. They wanted to go elsewhere. They got offered too much money. We're not in a position to do that. It would have been yep. over. That would have been it. But I mean, they did, they did it differently. So here we are. So, so those two are gone, but the giants did some amazing things with the money they did save. And that's where we should start. So let's just start with a big kahuna. They went, we started hearing the rumors from a uh, now famous, uh, pretty Ricky. Um, over the weekend about yeah, this trade. And, um, that's a whole phenomenon going on on its own. <laughs> it's got it's a lot of new, The new Carpenter, but he's like the, way, way, way better. It's like <laughs> the Carpenter who happens to work for David Mulligetta. Um, but uh, <laughs> but, but uh, it's just a little coincidence there, right, about all those names. Anyway, you guys can figure out what I'm talking about. Um, so the Brian Burns rumor started, and then by the close of – the first day, the Giants closed the deal with the Panthers. They sent a second round pick, our second round pick, 39 pick overall ultimately in this draft, a fifth round pick in 2025, and a pick swap in 2024, in this class, with the Panthers. And they got back Brian Burns, who they then turned around and signed to a five-year, $141 million contract. So Brian Burns, 25 years old, top 10 to 15 edge rusher in the NFL, ascending talent. What's your take on this one? I loved, loved this deal. I mean, look, there is a lot that still has to go with this. If you're going to make a move like this, you have to continue to build the right, the team the right way and not waste a talent like this. That's the first part of this. But just a mo- the move in a vacuum, I loved it. I think that you know, we can talk all day about how much they spent on Brian Burns. And I know it's some people's concern, you know, you gave him – he was the second highest paid edge rusher in the league, and he probably hasn't been a top five edge rusher to that. That's fine. That's fair. But I'll say this. If Brian Burns was a top five edge rusher and was 25 years old, he would have gone for probably what the Rams were trying to trade for, for Brian Burns for, for two firsts and a second. We got this guy for what we paid for Leonard Williams or what we what we got for Leonard Williams, literally we, instead yeah. of trading the Seattle, uh, Seattle's pick, we traded our second, but we traded a fifth next year. That's what we got back. It was almost the exact same trade. All we had to do was pay up a little bit for a top, uh, like a top 10, 25 year old edge rusher who has like limitless potential. This guy is incredible, incredibly athletic, incredibly good pass rusher. And you know, has shades of Daniel Hunter, who Andre Patterson shaped to be a top five edge rusher in this league. So I yep. love that signing. Um, you know, I'm going to let you get into it, but I'm going to tee you off a little bit here. You know, something, you know, they mentioned the athletic and we talked about a little bit, something about pre-investing, pre-spending before yep. you go and get your rookie quarterback. Sometimes you make some of these big swings. So the team is ready for when they come in. But what do you think of I, I think we have to get in that discussion as a discussion of its own. But before we do, I'll just say this about Brian Burns. Very young. A lot of debates this week as whether he's top 10, top 15. Um, I would say that's a largely – it's it's not necessarily an extraordinarily important argument. Um, you can argue the money they paid him was so high that, you know, that it should be that. And that's fair. But – if Brian Burns hit the open market, he would have gotten about $27, $28 million. I have zero doubt in my mind. 25 years old at that position with that productivity, that ability, he was going to get paid. So they paid him market value. I, I think that's fair. But they just got ha- they got their hands on him because there's no guarantee they would have gotten him if he actually hit the open market. He would have been open to bidders. And his price might have gone up 
you know, people don't want to believe it, but it's true. Um, I think that's a great deal. I think he's an ascending talent. Very few pass rushers his age with this many years of experience in the NFL have his productivity. Very few have his number of sacks and consistency with sacks, tackles for losses, total tackles. He's extremely productive. Could he be better? Of course. Is there more in the tank? Absolutely. The guy's a freak talent. His athletic testing was very similar to Kayvon Thibodeau, but he's a stronger version of it. He's more. He has a much more developed pass rush arsenal. He's a better power rusher, and he's better against the run. So he's advanced. He's at the level where, you know, you kind of, Mace has been saying this all week, and I agree with it. He had a great tweet about it, that you want Kayvon to become what Brian Burns is now, and you want Brian Burns to elevate to where the top guys are. You know, the mm-hmm. guys like like Bosa and Garrett. I think it's a very, very fair, honest assessment of things. But even if Burns doesn't elevate quite to that level, if he gets closer to there and you get, and he helps Kayvon get up there, that combination is deadly. This is what you pay for. This is what you want. You want a defensive line with two guys like that and Dexter Lawrence in the middle. And we'll get into the draft, but we are one high-end prospect of a defensive tackle away from having potentially the best defensive line in the NFL. Isn't this something we kind of talked about, Sal, where we had a guy in Dexter Lawrence who puts up like, you know, talk about top five pressure numbers. You know, Dexter Lawrence uh, for stretches is putting up pressures as high of pressure numbers as the top five edge rushers in this league. And we have that guy at the nose guard position. And now we have Kayvon Thibodeau and Brian Burns on the outside also capable of putting those types of numbers. You, it's just it's a cheat code having a guy like Kayvon, uh, Dexter Lawrence in the middle there racking up his type of, of pass rush production and then having two top end edge rushers who also can do that. You're not supposed to be able to get this type of pass rush on a team. And it's the potential with Dexter Lawrence centering all of that building around him is scary. Yep. No, it's awesome. I think that's that's how you want to build a defense. From you know the middle out, your pass rush, your linebackers, you're you're getting closer to putting together a powerhouse defense here. We're we're not that many pieces away. I mean, the secondary needs some pieces now, and you lost one to McKinney, but you know, I mean, I think you can find those pieces. They're easier to find in some ways, especially if you're running more of a zone defense. You just have to find the right bodies and and, and hand them off to a good coach and Jerome Anderson, who hopefully stays with us. Uh, but we're close on defense. So I love the signing. I can't wait to see what it untaps in take in cave on. I can't wait to see what defenses, ha- what offenses have to do, try to block Dexter Lawrence and these two guys and what Shane Bowen does with it because he should be able to really utilize these guys. So that was the big move. The Giants made a bunch of other moves over the last couple of days. Um, first and foremost, offensive line. That was the big drum we were beating. Shore up the offensive line, the interior line especially, and make sure you have some tackle flexibility. Everybody wanted uh, Michael and Wenu. Everybody wanted Robert Hunt. We we were yeah you were start you started we've been banging that drum since I don't know September we've been talking yeah. about those guys um, we thought we could get one of those guys for maybe sixteen million dollars nope uh, Robert Hunt got twenty million dollars from the Carolina Panthers um, I, and uh, Michael and Wendu got I think nineteen million right yeah he got nineteen and the funny thing is I don't like there were some people who smartly said I know you were a big advocate of of he these guys could get up higher and we think I know Cross was saying it. And it's funny, by the time all these guards got paid, and, and when we was the last one, he got paid 19. I saw people saying, that's it? He only got paid 19? <laughs> well, like, a week it's before. A before yeah, yeah, a week before, you were like, he's not, none of these guys are paid, paid more than 18. 18 is the max. Well, I mean, Jonah Jackson was being projected to make, I think Brad Spielberger had him making, like, 10 million or 8 million. And the yeah. dude got, got 16 million or something like that. 17, I think. 17 million. And, and so did uh, Kevin Dotson. He got 16, 17 million, both on the Rams, yep. by the way, who then put them opposite Steve Avila, who's now playing center. So they probably have the most fearsome interior line in the NFL right now. Mm-hmm. Um, no, the, the look, guards are valuable. And the league is noticing yep. that. And they're just paying them as, as valuable. And te- you tend to pay when there's a lack of quality guys coming out in the draft year in, year out. That's happening here. It's a supply demand issue. Good, these guys got paid. The Giants went a different route. Um, and I don't hate the route they went. I want to get your thoughts on it, but we end up signing John Runyon from the Packers, the son of uh, the old John Runyon, who was on the on the Eagles for years, Michael Strahan's old enemy nemesis uh, on, on those They're old right. lines. But, yeah. Um, for three years, $30 million for, for so $10 million a year. And they signed Jermaine Illuminor, 
uh, for two years, fourteen million dollars. The right tackle of the of the uh, Las Vegas Raiders played right tackle, left tackle, guard. Um, really came under, came, really came out and became a better player under uh, Carmen Brasillo. Uh, so total value of five years. Uh, well, total value of about seventeen million a year for the two of them. So, what are your thoughts on those two additions? Yeah, man. I mean, look, I wanted to get Michael Wenwu. I wanted to get Robert Hunt. Uh, nothing's changed there. I still wish we made a move like that, but I do think they pivoted well. I think those guys got out of their price range. You know, something we heard from Ricky as far as uh, Robert Hunt was that, you know, with the Panthers also I- into him and Robert Hunt being represented by the same agent as uh, Brian Burns, that it almost became a trade off that the Giants pulled out of Robert Hunt and pivoted to trading for Brian Burns. So, it sounds like that if that's true, that was some sort of trade off. Michael Wenwu ended up going back to New England. I still would have preferred to pay, you know, that 19, but I don't know if that was on the table or what. Regardless, I do like the players they brought in. That's the important part. I think Jermaine Luminor was an incredible signing. I mean, two seven years. Seven million a year. Seven years a, a year. I mean, that's like these low end tackles are getting paid paid like 10 million a year. I mean, more. I, they're in yeah. the mid teens. He's getting paid as a backup. And he was legitimately like a solid starting tackle last year. He is a quality uh pass protector. He's a really good uh run blocker. I watched both of Bo- uh Bobby Skinner's breakdown on uh John Runyon and, and Jermaine Illuminor. And I came away very impressed with both of those guys. Uh, you know, recommend anybody to check those reviews out. Um, and you know, he I think. You know, whether we end up playing him at guard or, you know, Neil uh, gets moved into guard, whatever, whatever happens there, I think he's going to be a good addition wherever we get. And you also got to love to see how happy he is to be a giant. He, oh, he's he, awesome. He has, like, he has the giddiness of like a rookie. Like the guy's he's, been in the le- league for like a decade. He's, yeah, like, I lo- he's like, I can't believe I'm on the Giants. I love that guy already. I've been following him on Twitter. He reached out to OCU and Euro to seek permission to wear 72. <laughs> and he said, I promise that I'll, I'll, I'll live up to it and play at that level. <laughs> I, 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 lo- I love it. It's respect, but also OCU's probably like, cool. Terry Wynn wore this jersey. Why are you asking me about it? He's, he's very polite English gentleman, this guy. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, no, but he's a beast. I love him. I mean, look, is he an elite player? No. He's just a really good football player. He's a good tackle. He's not a great tackle. I'll, let's say an average tackle, right? But he's a reliable right tackle. And he's a pretty decent guard. So, you know, I really am excited about this, mainly because, like we talked about, the whole point of wanting a guy like Unwenu is, no more scholarships for Evan Neal. You got to win that job. And I know that Joe Shane wants Evan Neal to win that job. Obviously, he spent his his seventh overall pick on him in his first draft. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's a third year. And you can't walk in and hand him the job. You just say that you can now legitimately say to Evan Neal, if you can't beat this guy out for right tackle, you're moving to the guard. The end. Whether it's left guard, right guard, I don't know. That depends on where they play. Um, Runyon. Runyon kind of hinted that he would prefer to play left guard. I don't know what the Giants are going to do. But in my opinion, if Evan Neal cannot win the right tackle job outright in the spring, he should be go to guard. You better win that job or you're on the bench. Uh, and, and, you know, that's that's how a team should operate. You should have to compete for that job. So I love that addition. And you know, you know that the Giants are going to push Neal at this point. They're not going to let Neal just sit there and sink the season. So that's the main reason I'd like to Luminar. He has way more value to the Giants than seven million a year. His agent didn't realize that, but I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I thought he was going to get in the territory of like eleven, twelve million, something like that. And he's only twenty nine; like he's still yeah. under thirty. Um, you know, what, one thing while we're on the Neil top a little bit, I tweeted it out and I and I talked to you about this. Talked this the other day. I've come around where you know I've been a big supporter that that I want. I don't. I'm not giving up on Evan Neal. I think Evan Neal, the new coach, could could take huge steps as a player. But, you know, obviously at this point, I don't feel he can be the same tackle that I thought when he was coming out of the prospect. It doesn't mean I don't think he can still be a good player. But, you know, the more I've been thinking about it, and after I saw all these guard contracts at this point, seeing these guards getting paid more than the tackles. You see a guy like 
Jonah Williams, who's a, a good, like a more than average offensive tackle, get paid less than like a Jonah Jackson, who's like an av- good to average offensive guard. At this point, I'm like, we don't know what Evan Neal can be at a guard. We haven't seen it. He played guard in college and he was good. At this point, we know he struggled at tackle. It, it does not seem to be a good fit for him. Maybe guard's a bad fit too, but we've seen it with a guy like Sam Cosme who got moved into guard and became like a top 10 guard in the NFL. Kevin Seven Jenkins, Jenkins. Yeah. A terrible, terrible, terrible tackle. Moved in his guard. He's one of the top in the NFL. A guy that we all know, Eric Flowers, awful tackle. He's a solid, solid guard in the NFL. Like, it, if he can be a good, like, instead of just saying, hey, we just need need Neil to be, you know, okay, be be all right at tackle. That's all we need. But instead, we oh, we change that to, can Neil be a, a good guard? Because a good guard is much more valuable than just a startable tackle. So, that's where my my gears are kind of like turning to and where I'm kind of shifting my attention. I know I know the Giants probably won't do that off the bat. I know they'll probably have it be a competition, but I'm starting to think like maybe moving Neil to guard at this point isn't necessarily like a in a bad thing like where it's a huge loss for doing this. Where this could end up coming out being like this this is a good thing for this organization because guards are still really valuable. Well, and I think that that's going to be the selling point to Evan Neal. Like, look, you're struggling here. If Evan Neal, let's just play it out. If he ha- plays a third year the way he's played the first couple of years at tackle, forget about getting tackle money on a second contract. There's a chance he's out of the NFL. I mean, guys like him, I don't care where you're drafted. Like, yeah, first round guys do tend to get a second shot, but you're talking about taking like vet minimum type deals after that and trying to fight for playing time to get a job. So if he struggles at a position he's just struggling at for another year, it, it could be over for him. It really could be um, in terms of getting any kind of money. If he transitions to guard now, if he just if there's sort of an honest assessment by the new coach and he says, look, I don't think this is going to work. And I think you would be really good at guard. If you're a good guard, you're going to you see what these guys are making. They're making like 20 million dollars. You know, you could do that. Yeah. I, I think Evan Neal would be open minded to it. I think he'd actually embrace the role if he accepted the fact that he's not a tackle and he could be a very good guard, you know, he played a good, a good guard uh, in Alabama. I mean, he played a good tackle at Alabama too, but what he struggled with were outside speed rushers. Um, That's less, obviously not really an issue on the inside. The one issue I would worry about with Evan Neal on the inside is his height and his leverage would still be a problem. You know, usually guards are in the six, three, six, four height range. He's what six, seven, you know, so he's going to have to play with the lower pad level and he's going to have to adapt to that. So there's no guarantee he's going to work out. But I think at this point, I would probably, I wonder what the Giants are thinking, but I'd probably let these guys compete knowing, like I let them go in and say, look, the the better player wins a job flat out. We're not waiting on this. If you lose a job in camp, you're out and you transition quickly to guard, but you're taking reps at both tackle and guard, both of you, and see what happens. This time I actually want to see a rotation. Um, I want to see, I actually want to see it for those two guys specifically. Mm. So, um, it's gonna be it's gonna be good. I think the Illuminar signing is incredible for what it does for the team. Obviously, he's not Mike and Wenu. He doesn't have that resume, but at a third of the price, yeah, that's and spectacular it, value. And accomplishes the same thing that we wanted in a Robert Hunt or Wenu. And I'll say this: Wenwu, uh, I mean not Wenwu, uh, Illuminar. I I trust more at tackle than I trust Robert Hunt. I Robert Hunt. I wanted because he's an incredible guard and has played tackle. But I'll take a Lumin- Luminor out there at tackle. I've seen it more recently. I've seen him play at a quality level. Obviously, I'd rather hunt a guard. But if 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 that's where it goes to, and we think it's going to be a situation where Neil ends up at tackle, then all right. Well, I'm glad we have a Luminor there. Absolutely. So I think that's how the, the Giants have tackled O line so far. I personally can see this playing out if they don't add another body, and I'm pretty sure they're going to add another body at some point whether it's bringing back Brent Bredesen or waiting for somebody else to get cut and taking them on later or drafting someone. Somebody's somebody's going to join this unit. Some sort of vet name guy. Or right. Something. You still have Josh Azudu and Marcus McKeithen for what it's worth. I don't know what's going to happen with those two, um, but I'm assuming they're going to get a chance to at least fight for a roster spot. <clears throat> and um, I think I can see a world where the, the line left to right looks like this. Andrew Thomas, Evan Neal, John Michael Schmidt, John Runyon, and Jermaine Illuminor. 
if you want to swap Runyon for for Neal and put Neal at right guard, that's you know that I think whatever. But the but the point is your your interior being in some way, shape, or form, Runyon, JMS, and Neal. I, I have a feeling that we're going to be seeing that, and I think we're going to see that sooner than later. Yeah. Um, we, we talked a lot about Luminor before we totally move off this. What was some of your thoughts about Runyon? So Runyon is a guy that I actually, I know people were not excited about the, about the signing. They felt like he was the, le, you know, lesser than some of the others. Uh, they were surprised that he got 10 million. But in retrospect, when you look at the whole forest from the trees in terms of what these guys got paid, Runyon got paid, I think, a fair deal. Uh, I don't think he got underpaid. I don't think he got overpaid. I think he got about what a guy like him would make in this market. Mm-hmm. He's a very good pass blocker. I think that's been well established. He used to be a tackle, right? So he has he has tackle yep. chops also. He has a little bit of flexibility. Although he was not a he was not a good tackle. Yeah, um, he hasn't done it in the NFL, but right. Um, he was in college, um, mm-hmm. you know, and he uh, he's a Michigan grad, so he's well he's he's well well coached. We know that. It, it, so I think he's a very good pass blocker. He's a little light. Um, for the position, and I think he does tend to struggle. Bobby Skinner did a good breakdown where, you know, bull rushers on the interior who are just more powerful than him, they might give him a hard time. Um, I don't know if you can technique that away. You know, sometimes that's just a power thing. So there are going to be some issues in, pa- in run blocking, I think. Depends on how they utilize them, but to be honest, a quality interior pass rusher is what I want for a young quarterback. If we're going to go get a young quarterback, as I think we're going to go get I want somebody who can hold up and pass protection on the interior to give that kid a chance to throw the ball. So I'm perfectly fine with an imperfect signing of a guy who's a better pass blocker than run blocker. That's what I think of John Runyon. What are your thoughts on him? Yeah, no, I feel the same as you. I, you know, I was, I'm less excited, even though we paid him more about John, John Runyon than I'm uh, Jermaine Illuminor, but I do think he's a quality signing. I, you know, I, I watched Bobby's breakdown as well. And, you know, there's definitely some stuff that I took away that was good. Um, I mean, and also just looking at the numbers, he he's really good, like top 10 pass block efficiency, like the last three years. That's great stuff to look for. You know, he, it seems like in pass protection, you know, he, he understands his um, weaknesses and with strength and he, He's a very aggressive pass blocker, which most of the time works out for him. And sometimes, you know, it, uh, if if he misses with his hands, he can he can lose badly. But most of the time, he'll be good. Um, and, you know, same you can kind of same go with the run game to an extent where he could, you know, kind of being over aggressive can lead to him losing badly. On top of him just not really being a great run blocker. That part I don't love. I hope he can continue to improve at that. But um, but yeah, he is. Seems to be a very good pass protector. It seems like the things that we've seen for the last decade from the interior offensive line with none of our guards knowing how to pick up a stunt, hopefully will be a thing of the past with run running, which is, you know, exciting. That's I like I like to see that. And um, you know, I think he's a guy who will uh will will not be hearing about in a lot of games. He's not a guy whose name we'll, we'll keep bringing up, which we haven't had the luxury of doing with our interior offensive linemen. So um, the combination of Runyon and Illuminor, I like, I didn't love the Runyon signing in a vacuum, but I didn't have any problem with the value or anything. I just, I, I need, I, I don't think that he is a guy, as we talked about, who's going to make the players around him better, which was my hope was getting a guy. I think he's just a guy who holds, holds up his, his side of the bar at least in the past game. So it's, I, I'm fine with the signing. It, it, it you know, uh, they went with the quality over, uh, the the quantity over quality approach, I think, with the offensive line. Yeah, and I, I'm fine with that, as long as they can put it together. You know, at the end of the day, these guys have to go out there as a unit mesh, do a good job. You know, you're not talking about, you didn't get an elite guy, but you got a couple of good players and you added them to the mix who really helped the diversity of that line. So I was pretty happy with it. I do think they're going to target someone else, probably the draft. I'm, I'm, I, I cannot imagine the Giants leading this draft, even though they only have six picks right now, um, with, without, a, without some sort of lineman, you know, whether it's a guard or a tackle. I just can't imagine it. Um, and I, I have a feeling it, it might be one of these guys, you know, who has guard tackle flexibility, another one. You know, I, I, there are a lot of those guys in this class. So I, I like what they did. Moving on to other positions. We talked about Drew Locke. I mean, I don't know if there's much else to say about him. I think he's a 
fairly quality backup at this point. Talk about Drew Locke. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Sarge, we'll talk about Drew Locke. Drew Locke is a big, big dummy with a big <laughs> arm. He's, he's the prototype. Uh, so kid drafted in the same draft as Daniel Jones out of Missouri. I think he went in the second round to the Broncos. Um, huge arm, no brains, makes a lot of stupid decisions, gunslinger mentality, challenges the field at, at, at all levels, but will throw the ball into danger a lot. Throws as many touchdowns as he does interceptions. You know, he's he's like he's got a little bit of J Bo in him. Uh, he's got that mm-hmm. same mentality, kind of a gunslinger. But I like I like his swag. I like the guy's moxie on the field. You know, he's fearless. He's a. I think the team tends to gravitate around him. I saw that in the games he played as a starter in Seattle. So I think he. You know, you could do a lot worse for a backup. What do you think about Drew Lock, Monty? Yeah, man. Well, I mean, at least you know, it'll be fun watching him sing Jeezy on the sidelines. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's he, me, you know Daniel Jones with you know a little a little bit more uh, moxie, a little a little bit more aura. But um, uh, he but uh, no, he's he is he's not he, he he's gonna get a chance to I think to compete with Daniel Jones for this job. And we talked about it earlier. I think that he could get it just off the fact that he might be able to open his offense more. That's not necessarily a good thing. Um, he's, he's, we're not, we're not going to, you know, it's going to be cool seeing us take shots on the field, but it's not necessarily, I think, going to result in wins. If Drew Locke's out there, um, he's going to make a lot of mistakes. Um, he's going to cost his team games. Look, I, I just hope that if Drew Locke goes out there and starts games for us, that's a limited time basis. Well, whoever we get a rookie quarterback is, is waiting in the wings till they're ready. Yeah, we'll um, see. I, I, there is no world where we are starting Daniel Jones or Drew Locke where I feel good about our quarterback <laughs> position. But, um, if they, yeah, that, I think the most interesting thing about Drew Locke is what we learned about from John Schneider today. You know that the Giants said to him, "You are going to compete to be a starter." I think they they alluded to the fact that it could be something like a Baker Mayfield role. Which is insane when you think about it, because Baker Mayfield was basically like the lead. He was the lead dog coming into camp to be the starter in Tampa last year. And he outright won the job, obviously. But the fact that you're talking about him being in in a lead dog type position potentially to win the job says a lot more about Daniel Jones than it does about Drew Locke. Um, So it's interesting. The really interesting thing about Drew Locke to me, like we talked about before, is I... I just think they're done with Jones. I, I think the smoke the smoke is too thick at this point. There's too much noise, too much smoke. Um, our buddy Mason, who was on our last show, alluded to this. Um, and it's an interesting point that he brought up that, look, the Giants are on the hook for a 22 or $23 million injury guarantee after this year. If they draft a quarterback, if they take a quarterback in the first round, Drake May, J.J. McCarthy, Michael Pettinx, whoever, right? Jaden Daniels. They've got their quarterback of the future. And they've got Drew Locke and they've got Tommy DeVito. They could post June 1 outright cut Daniel Jones. And of the $60 million of cap hit remaining on his, of guaranteed cap hit remaining on his contract, they could just split it. And instead of, you know, instead of eating $47 million on the cap this year, add some of that to next year. And take a 30 million cap hit this year and basically just kind of clean out, be evened out and move on, get him off the team and let him go elsewhere. I don't think this is what they're going to do, but I can't deny that it's an intriguing possibility that the giants in theory could be so like, if they're really done with Jones and they've moved on, they get another, they've got drew lock in here. If they get a rookie quarterback, what, what do you do with Daniel Jones? Like he's just sitting around. He's, he's QB three on the bench. Like, what are you doing with him? They may realistically just say, we're going to cut ties, let you go elsewhere, kid. Here's your money. Goodbye. And so what do you think about that? It's look, man, if it was just the ACL and we're like, like I heard Dan Duggan talk about this and I, I understand where he's coming from, but like, it's like, it's like you have time, like the get ready and stuff like that. And yeah, if it's, if he's just going to tear his ACL in September, you'll be fine by, you know, being able to cut him in March, but that's not necessarily what we're worrying about either. He's had two serious neck injuries at this point. You know, there is no timetable if he if he gets neck. We've seen this multiple times. When he gets those neck injuries, that timetable is gone. There is there is no like 
six to ten weeks or any bullshit like that. If he hurts his neck, there is no telling when he is going to get cleared. I think you're playing a very dangerous game to put Daniel Jones back out in the field if you're committed to moving on from him. So, look, I think that's the move. If you draft a rookie and you know it's over, I would rather, like, put Drew Locke in there and start the season and cut Daniel Jones. Because, look, you can't just put Daniel Jones on the sideline. That's how you get the Russell Wilson situation where you get, a, like, a players association grievance because because we're not playing him for injury uh, guarantees. You At that point, you just let him go and you wish him well and let him go be with another team and have a chance there. So I don't know, like you said, I don't know if that's what they will do. But that's what I would do, if especially if we, we draft a rookie quarterback. Yeah, I'm not sure what they'll do. But, I mean, Frank asked in the chat, you know, wouldn't you want to just take his dead cap this year and less next year? In theory, yeah, I mean, that's true. You want to just eat that money now. But what if you need some of that money this year to operate next year, um, you know, to operate without restructuring some guys, and it leaves you the flexibility of not restructuring decks, for example. I mean, that the money's the same, you know? I've- yeah, it it leaves it open. Um, you're you're probably gonna have to restructure some money anyway. It's interesting. Like you could get that money. This you could get that by cutting Jones and post June wanting him, and you get the money to operate. So um, that was a funny comment. <laughs> How did DJ have two neck injuries? Mike Glennon had zero because <laughs> he because he has a stronger neck. Obviously, yeah, it's, it's, you it's, can it's, see the strength in it. <laughs> it's got it's, it's got like one of those. You ever see like the people in like like the women in Africa, and then there's some women in like some South Asian countries where they have like the rings in their neck. Yeah. <laughs> they like extend their neck. That, that's like Mike Glennon's fortified neck. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's why. Um, so yeah, Mason is saying the problem is a pre June one. We lose 22 million. Exactly. We're not going to pre June one cut Jones yeah. and lose 22 million. But if you post June one of them, you kind of break even, you save a little space, you know, you, you push a little bit of money for next year. Um, yeah, and from- we have 95 million in next year's cap right now. 95 million. And so, if, and if you, you lose Jones, if you just cut him after the season, you save, I think, 22 million, something like that. Yep. From, from um, my understanding, cutting Jones post June 1st is you're literally paying him the exact amount of money and dead money as you're paying him to be on the team. And the, po- and the 2025 hit is 22 million, which is the exact same amount as if you cut him after this year. So it's just, yeah. it's a total. Total wash. In my yeah, and, and the reality, like you said, you don't want the guy pouting on the on the sideline. To be honest, if you're his agent, if you see the writing on the wall where they've drafted a rookie, they've brought in Drew Lock, and their their stories are being told that Drew Lock is here to compete for the starting job, like you're probably asking out at that point. You're saying, you know what, cut me, release me from my contract, and I will go elsewhere or try to trade me. Nobody's going to trade for him, most likely in this situation. I don't think you could even get it like a day three pick at this point. Um, so he might ask for a cut. Keenan Allen to the Bears confirmed. All right. The Bears are doing interesting things for a fourth round. They gave up a fourth round pick for Keenan. They were going to cut Keenan Allen. A wild move. They're they're preparing, they're preparing for Caleb Williams. Trying trying to get him the weapons he needs. Keenan Allen. Style. <laughs> Keenan Allen was playing with Phillip Rivers. This is true. So Darius Slate was playing Eli Manning. Mm. <laughs> do you do you think Jones would consider a pay cut for another shot at starting from Will? I think you have to ask him um, if you want to give him a shot. But if you don't want to give him a shot, why even ask him? You know, I, I think that's how I look at it. They might be done, Will. I think they may be completely done with this guy. You know what's the interesting thing with it is you basically have to pull a Sean Payton if you want to give him a chance to start. You need to say, Hey, we're cutting you. Instead of saying Benjamin, we're cutting you if you don't wipe your injury guarantee. He and clarified how, the statement. Yeah. And after how poorly that went with Sean Payton, I, I, yeah, we'll see. So, and I mean, pay cut as in restructure that removes injury clause, gives him some more guarantee. Yeah, we talked about that. Like, I think you could approach him and say, if you want to stay on this team, remove the injury clause. Go right ahead and take it out. Um, but Russell Wilson himself said, I wouldn't do it and take that, do that to other players. I think the players association would have something to say about that. I think they would step in and say, you agree to that. We don't want you to do that. There would be pressure on him not to, I don't know what he would do. Yeah. I think it's, it's a bad, it's bad timing for something like that to happen just based on 
oh, everything just went down of Russ. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't think that, <clears throat> I don't think that Daniel Jones is likely to. I mean, he may accept it, but you know, it's possible, I guess. But do the Giants even want to keep him at that point? I mean, think about it. Like, what's the point? Unless you're just holding on to him to trade him, I guess that's the value, right? Like, if you say to him, "Look, we'll play you. You start the season. If you play well, we might be able to find a, a landing spot for you." But you got to remove the injury protection. Okay, I can see that, you know. Um, but they're also trying to sell this idea that he may not be ready. He may have had a setback. Maybe he did. Maybe he didn't. I don't know. And that you know, I think they're kind of they're selling hard the idea that Drew Locke is here to start because Daniel Jones is hurt. That that's kind of what's being sold by the the Giants media team right now. So I don't know where this sits. All I can see is they're clearly trying to move on from him, either as soon as possible or by the end of next year. I'm pretty sure that's what's happening at this point. Agreed. So I I, th- I I know we're getting a little bit derailed, but I want to say one more thing. K Mac brought up a good point. Chargers have to be going wide receiver at five. I mean they they cut Mike Williams, they cut Keenan Allen. They don't have to. Johnston, Johnston wasn't any good. I don't know. It seems like signs are pointing towards it. I mean, they need a they need a right tackle. They need it. They could use a tight end. They could take Brock Bowers. Um, you don't know. Um, yeah. You know, John J, Jim Harbaugh likes to build inside out. So I wouldn't be shocked if he sat there and just took Joe Alt. You know, I wouldn't be shocked or trade it down. That's still a good trade down spot. They need a lot on their roster. They need a lot, a lot of a lot of heat about yeah. teams wanting to trade off. So. And that's a good spot. Like if you're trying to jump the Giants to take somebody, that might be a spot. That's one to watch, you know. Uh, so let's move on to the the other free agents the Giants brought in. So we lost Saquon Barkley. We signed the new 26, Devin yep. Singletary. Took his Dylan, number right away. Dylan Orleans Dark was number. Orleans Dark was no Antrell roll. Antrell roll. Long line of great giants who wear 26. Do you, do you think he called Orleans Darkwell and asked if he could wear the number? He called Antrell <laughs> Roll. Yeah, yeah. That's what As he, he did. Yeah. He said, and he said, at the end of the day, no. Um, <laughs> do you remember that's how he started every sentence? At the end of the day. What time is it? At the end of the day, it's 3 p.m. Uh, so De- Devin Singletary, three years, 16 and a half million, about five at five and a half million dollars per year. I forget how much was guaranteed on that. I think it was about nine million that they guaranteed. Yeah, I think it was like nine or ten or something like that. Um, solid football player was drafted by the Bills, you know, played in Buffalo before going on to Houston, where he had a solid year. His advanced metrics are good, not great. I think he, his yards after contact has gone down a little bit over the years, but it's still decent, not as good as Saquon Barkley, but he's not Saquon Barkley. Um but he's very good at breaking tackles, surprisingly. Um, and he's he's good in the run game. He's good in the pass game. He's a reliable pass protector. He's a he solid captured. player. Yeah, and he can catch the ball. It's a solid player as you're building your running back by committee, which is obviously where we're going. So give me your thoughts on Devin Singletary. Yeah, man, I like the signing. I mean, I think it made a lot of sense. I, I you know, we, people mention Zach Moss a lot. Um, it seems like that was the favorite for many people. Me, I, I was of the opinion that, you know, if Zach Moss is the guy who's going to get more, then I would take Devin Singletary for less. Um, I like Devin Singletary more. So, you know, the fact that they prioritize Devin Singletary, I'm cool with that because I do think that Devin Singletary is a good all-around player. Um, I think the most important part of this, though, is, you know, we've talked about, I think we talked about this in spaces a little bit today, is that we are finally moving away from the the running game style that was underneath Saquon Barkley that well, we weren't prioritizing get, getting yards on every single play. We were right. prioritizing breaking the big run because he was the one guy in the team who who made those big plays for us. And in the result, it was, you know, negative one yard, one yard, negative two yards, 30 yards. You know, we, we talked about this and I think I'm much happier about, you know, giving us a situation we or we're going to be in third and short more often than we have been in the past, or maybe even not get the third down at all. We'll we'll see about that. But um, I I think that he can bring that to this offense, and I think you know spending that money on the offensive line is instead of the running back is a good move for us. Yeah, uh, I love 
where they're going with this. Obviously, he's a good, not great player, but here's and, and this is going to sound like sacrilege to some people, but I made I, I talked to Ivan about it earlier today. It's fair to say that obviously Saquon Barkley was a great giant in terms of his ability to produce explosive plays. He's a freak talent. We all know that. But what plagued Saquon Barkley for much of his career was the inconsistency of his yards per of his yards per carry, not the overall numbers because he would, they would always average out to four point something. They looked fine, but drive after drive very frequently. And we saw this for years where he would get handoff one yard, handoff, two yards, handoff, negative one yard, right? Drive over handoff, two yards, handoff, 65 yards. Right. And so the, you know, the overall numbers are good, but there was an inconsistency. He was a home run hitting threat. There wasn't a lot of, you know, and this might be, this might be an offensive line issue. I'm not putting this all on Saquon. But the offense, at least, the run game for years has been hand the ball off and maybe get a yard or two, maybe get a loss, get to third and long, put it on, put the ball in third and long to a, you know, and give it to a quarterback who's not very good at reading defenses, definitely struggles against pressure. Uh, and that stalled a lot of drives over the last several years with the Giants. I think the Giants and in past games in general would work best when you have a more consistent hand the ball off, fall forward for four yards, hand the ball off or fall, fall forward for five yards. You might not have the home runs. You might not have the explosive plays from the run game, but you're getting your quarterback into second and manageable third and short much more often, which produces a higher success rate in the passing game, which is where you produce a better opportunity from EPA perspective, from point score perspective to get points on the board for your team. So. I wouldn't be shocked if the Giants' run game is more efficient and they have more sustainable drives without Barkley and with Singletary. Not because Singletary is better, but because the focus of how they run the run game is going to be different, and he's just a different style runner. So what are your thoughts on that? No, I totally agree with you. I think it's it's been an issue before with this team, and we, we've seen we've even seen it when Saquon's got hurt. I know like people hate to hear it, but when Wayne Goldman was in, we had a more sustainable running style that year because he just kept moving forward. He was not a better running back. Our offense was not necessarily better as a whole, but it was a, we, we picked up yards more. It was more sustainable on, on the ground for, especially for an offensive line that did not open up lanes to consistently break things open for Saquon Barkley. And I will say for the price difference, we're always kind of like, it's like invest in the offensive line, don't invest in the running back. It's really clear the numbers are ex- actually exact right now. You look at the, Saquon Barkley got twelve and a half million per year from from the Philadelphia Eagles. We paid Devin Singletary five and a half. We paid Jermaine Illuminor seven a year. That is an exact trade off between those two. And I would rather Devin Singletary and Jermaine Illuminor to help open up this run game with a true, you know, power, powerful alignment than to roll it out with Saquon Barkley and whatever bum Tyree Phillips that we've been doing in the past. Yeah. That lineman can help your quarterback and your running back. You know, the running back can only yep. help the running back. Um, so that's the issue. Now I got to acknowledge our chat um, because we described Singletary as a guy who's kind of a, he's a good pass receiver. He's not really a power runner, but he's a solid hit the gap run for four yards kind of guy. But he's not a, not what you would call like a monster power rusher. How do you complement a guy like Singletary in a running back by committee? It's probably not your boy Bucky Irving. Yeah, they're the same. But, but there's a couple of other backs in this class, man, who are those big powerful backs who you can hand the ball off to, who are going to knock people over and drag them down for five, six yards and wear down the defense who would be excellent, excellent compliments to him. So obviously I'm talking about Blake Corum from Michigan. Uh, I'm waiting for the response. All right. I'll say it. Audrey Estime from Notre Dame. Cute it up just a second too early. <laughs> uh, Audrey Estime. So, yeah, obviously, Audrey Estime, like, like we got our Notre Dame contingent saying, say it, say it. They're totally right. Audrey Estime is the guy. He is the perfect prototype to match what or to complement what Singletary does. Uh, and actually, if you think about it, Estime could come in and be kind of like your Brandon Jacobs power guy, 
And you can have a Singletary who could be maybe more of like, maybe a little bit more like a Bradshaw type, you know, not quite that speed. And actually a guy like, you know, I don't want to throw him away. Eric Gray, they just didn't use him right. He could be a Derek Ward type back in that system. You know, good receiver, decent runner. Like that trio might be a really good one. So if the Giants in the fourth round handed, you know, that's probably where Audrick Estime is going fourth. If you're lucky, maybe he falls to the fifth. Probably somewhere in the fourth round. If you hand him a card, four seven. We'll talk about the combine stuff. Yeah, we'll get there. But if he's there for you on you know day three sometime, and you hand him the card, you get Audric Estime. You've got yourselves a room. You've got yourselves. Yeah, there you go, mate, Sarge. Earth, wind, and fire two point oh. That's exactly right. I mean, I don't know if we really have. Do we have fire? I'm not sure. Um, But you know, Singletary is only here for like a year or two. Uh, But I think that's a great back to add. All right, Braylon Allen too. DK really wants to say Braylon Allen. Um, and Frank says, don't say Braylon Allen. All right. <laughs> I said it. Um, no, I think I think Estime is the perfect back. I actually love – you guys know I love Blake Corum. I think he's perfect for this also. But he might be a little too expensive. He's probably going in the third round. I don't know if we want to spend our third round pick when we only have one second round pick now. So uh, I think Estime is the target. But we're ready to have a running back make committee again. I like what they're doing. Let's get to yeah. some of the other free agents uh, so we can get through this. Um, so we also signed, we lost McKinney. We signed Jalen Mills. The guy I mentioned know. in our free agency preview with connections, what, you know, was there in, in Philadelphia with Brandon Brown. So, yeah, you know, uh, he's, I mean, he's, a, he, he's a body. Yeah. I think, I think he's your Bobby McCain this year. I think. That's, yeah, that's exactly. A, at that minimum. Right. There's no guarantee he'll make the team. I think he's a special teamer if he yeah. does make the team. And I think he's a, he's a guard. He's a, he's a kind of a reserve safety. I don't think he's a starter. I doubt it, but who knows? Um, you still have Javarius Owens. You have Jason Pinnock. You have Dane Dalton. You know, you have those guys on the roster. And he has some corner versatility if you need it. He played corner for most of his right. uh, career in the NFL. So if you really are desperate, you, you have him for it. So. Right. We we signed Isaiah McKenzie, our annual midget from the Bills that we had to sign. We have to get one every year. Uh, <laughs> so. well, we got two. We got Devin Singletary as well. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so Isaiah McKin- I love it. Actually, I really like Isaiah McKinney. He's a good player. I, I uh, like that signing a lot. He's a good returner. He's a very good returner. Special teams, backup gonna slot bat- receiver. You yep, know, he's going to battle with Gunner. I think Gunner is the better returner, but you know, Isaiah McKenzie adds more in the past game. So it's going to be interesting how it I think plays I, out there. I can see him pushing Gunner off this team. Yeah, um, good, good solid. I, I have no problem with that with that signing. It's a fairly minimal contract. And then we brought back Nick McLeod. We tendered him a, a restricted free agency contract. Um, I like bringing back Nick McLeod a lot. I think he's a very underrated football player. Very, very good defensive back. Yep. And that's what he is. He's a DB. He's a nickel. He can play. He can play some outside corner if you need him to. He can play safety. He's a useful defensive back. He's kind of a Swiss Army knife back there. I really like the kid. So we brought him back. Um, you had to bring him back, especially when you lost McKinney. Just makes your life easier. Um, any thoughts on these guys on block at all, or are we just good with it? And you're adding the tight end. Yeah, I just I typed in also Jack Stoll. We signed today from uh, Philadelphia, and our vetman guy, but you no know, good, a good blocking tight end, which is something we've been needing to add. So you know, hopefully he's good enough to make the team because we need a blocking tight end, but we'll see if he, if he's good enough. Um, I don't know. I mean, we, we, we brought back, I mean, the Lawrence Cager thing is not confirmed yet. Right. If we actually brought him back. I saw something, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, and if anybody in the chat knows, uh, you know, say it, but um, I mean, I think Darren Waller at this point is, you have to assume the guy's not playing football for the Giants this year. Yeah. I you have know. to go on with that assumption. At least, you know, maybe he will, but you gotta go with that assumption. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know what to make of it. Apparently, you know, again, Pretty Ricky said he's AWOL um, from the Giants is what he heard. Um, I think we've heard other stories about that, too, that he's been, you know, unhappy, grappling with his injuries, his personal life, whatever it may be. I feel for him as a person. I have no room for that as an organization. You need to know what you're doing with that money and that player and that roster spot. Um I have a feeling that they they have a plan with him. They just haven't announced it yet. Somebody had mentioned that maybe they they offered him a pay cut, and he's deciding between taking a pay cut and you know retiring. I don't know, but I think you're going into the season thinking he's not part of it. 
You can always spend a day three pick on a special, special talent at tight end who happens to play at Kansas State. And we can get to that later. Yeah, <laughs> you we'll know, talk about him because he killed it. <laughs> All right. So that's our free agency. You want to hop into some of the anything else before we hop into the combine stuff? Um, no, I th- I mean I think I think that's about it. Well, um, you know, I think overall I'm really happy what we've done so far. I think that uh I don't expect to see a lot of other big moves. Like I saw a question earlier. Hang on, I'll throw this up. Um, you know, Harlem's own said thought about thoughts on adding Dalton uh Reisner. And so like the one thing I'll say about the free agency, I think I think we're gonna be playing the comp pick game at this point. I if you know we lose more people than we get, you know, there's a very good chance we get a significant uh comp pick for Xavier McKinney because our big move was with Brian Burns, which doesn't account towards the comp pick formula. So we'll see who we lose. We'll see about Adore, we'll see about Isaiah Simmons, Isaiah Hodgins, people like that, see where they go, see if they get signings. But um I think we're going to keep these moves to cut guys, bet men guys, and maybe we'll look into a guy like a Dalton and Reisner, you know, after the draft and post June when those, those players don't count towards the cop formula anymore. But overall, I'm, you know, I'm pretty happy with where we're at. Just continue to add little depth pieces. Uh, you have a, any final thoughts on, on the free agency? Nope. People want a fullback. We'll get to a fullback, not in free agency. <laughs> yeah. We'll get to a guy who can play it. All right, let's let's head to the combine stuff, man. So, combine is now about a week and a half away from where we are now. Almost two weeks. A lot of stuff happened. Uh, I don't think anything too crazy, but it's worth noting since we did so much work on the combine. Who were the risers? Who were the fallers? Um, and how certain guys perform. So let's talk about. Let's start with the risers. Um, why don't you start there? And uh, we'll start at the top with the quarterbacks. Which quarterbacks performed well enough to either? keep their stock the same or improve it. I think JJ McCarthy did did well for his stock at the combine. You know, he he got some shit because you know he started off a little bit slow throwing. We, you know, we've talked about this before. He has some inconsistencies throwing to his left. Um and that's where you know this starts out in the throwing drills and he had he it te- yeah yep he, he opens it's up a little bit too much he fires a, it out. It's a footwork thing. Yeah. Yeah it's fixable, but you know, it's something we knew about. And, you know, after that, he, he, he threw like a hundred percent completion percentage to the right side after that. he had a really good throwing session after that. I think ultimately it kind of evens out where on his day, I think he's had a fine throwing day, but really where I was, I think JJ McCarthy did help his stock was he weighed in a 219 pounds. Um, and not, not only did he cut weigh in a 219 pounds, <laughs> With with you know uh, the uh, all that water weight there, um, he 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 went ahead and he ran a six eight two three cone and then a four two three shuttle. So you know he matched weighing in heavy with a like elite elite agility scores. So you can't knock That's him a, too much for the weight when that, he's putting up the the athletic numbers too. So it's creatine sandwiches, man. You gotta yeah. You gotta you gotta oh. dip you gotta dip your hummus in it, and <laughs> you gotta do whatever you gotta do to get that thing in your butt in your Double system. Double meat at Chipotle. Uh, whatever. <laughs> Double up on protein. Hummus. Drink, drink three gallons of water before the combine. Whatever it takes to get that weight up. There's no way in hell JJ McCarthy plays at two nineteen. Um, yeah, he did look he, bigger though. Oh, he put on some muscle. Uh, but you know, I think last year, not last year, but in in twenty twenty two, he played at like one eighty five, one ninety, and then he. He pushed up to 200 this year, like 200, 205. So pushing up another 14, 15 pounds for the combine is definitely a lot of like, I I worked out a lot, put on some water weight, put on some muscle. He's going to probably slim down to closer to 210, I would imagine. That's what I'm thinking. I think he's closer to a true 210 probably. But at 21 and 210 at his frame, he's going to naturally gain weight, get to about 220, 225 as he gets older. And and look, every one of these quarterbacks do these things. And so, and when we compare them, like – He's right there with any of these other guys who put on fake weight for the combine and, and, you know, were weighed in at 215, 220. So, you know, it, 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 he, he was just playing the game and I think it worked well for him. Um, you know, yeah, he, I mean, people saw his velocity. He had some inconsistency yep. throwing the deep ball, but I think he could actually throw it pretty easily. And he hit, and they do the velocity testing. Um, you know, you don't put a ton of stock in that stuff. It's the how they're, how they test it now is relatively new. 
but still he put up 61 miles per hour on that which is yeah. the second highest time that they've ever but, recorded there's some few people who've tied for 62 but and um, it's worth dis- it's worth discussing that you know you posted a great uh a cutout tweet from move the sticks pod um today where trevor sikama was a guest talking about arm talent and he talked about guys who actually have arm talent and he defined he defined it really well as guys who can throw with real velocity into tight windows use the middle of the field and can challenge all levels of the field because they have the ability with their arm strength to do that and the willingness to do that and are able to be successful throwing to all levels of the field he specifically mentioned drake may and jj mccarthy as guys who definitely shine in those areas I think that kind of matches what you and I saw. Like, are they yep. perfect prospects? Absolutely not. They need a lot of work. They're prospects. Like JJ needs a ton of work. He needs more reps. He needs coaching. He needs he needs some footwork work issues work. You know, he just needs he needs reps and he needs experience. And and he is a guy that you could consider redshirting at least for part of the first year. You know, and teaching and and he's any time. Drake May needs work with certainly with some of his footwork issues, decision making stuff. He ne- he needs the big dummy whisperer that is Brian Dable. Yeah, you know that kind of guy to help. But the talent is not teachable, right? That's hard. You can't teach yep. that arm. And so we saw it, and people were saying, oh, average arm from a cart. Like, and we watched it. We're like, what are you guys talking about? This guy has an absolute cannon, and he does. So he, he showed out well for the stuff that people care about in terms of traits. Not saying he's perfect at all as a prospect. But I think there are values and traits that these, that these teams look for. He's got it. He helps his stock, I think. Maybe not a ton, but I think enough where they said, okay, we feel comfortable this guy should be probably in the territory of a top 10 pick. That's where he yeah. is right now. Whether yeah. he goes, he could go as high as three, uh, or, you know, he can fall out of the top 10 and go in the middle of the first round. That's still possible, right? But I think he shored up a stock where the most likely outcome is somewhere between picks four and eight. Somewhere in that is probably where he's going to land. Yeah. And, you know, to the the conversation with the R, I mean, when Travis Sikma was talking about that, you know, that was led in by talking about Caleb Williams and how he has that ability. And, and I think you can throw Michael Penix in there as well as another guy who did, even though he wasn't mentioned. But, you know, I think it's something that, you know, um, I think a, a faller that is with uh, Bo Nix. And, you know, it's something that we've talked about is that, you know, people cite his big arm and, you know, it's something that Travis Sikma talked about. There's a lot of quarterbacks in the NFL who, you know, can can sit back, change change their sh- where they sink their shoulder and put air under the ball and send the ball 50 yards in, in the air or whatever. Like that a lot of quarterbacks in the NFL can do that, but that's not how you judge arm talent and arm strength. That that there that that's just what many quarterbacks in this league can do. It's it's the velocity that you put in. That's yeah. where you can really see it. And you know, a uh, uh, Lance Sterling who's Somebody who's been very, very high on Bonex. He he had Bonex a higher grade than than CJ Stroud to start this process. And he has lowered him down twice now. And both times for the reason he said after the senior bowl, and then again after the combine, he said the reason he lowered him is he saw him in person. He expected better arm strength. And when he stood there on the field, the velocity just did not pop out when he was playing outside of a of uh throws that were were similar to the Oregon State system he didn't see his ability to make those type of throws so it's a lot of what we we're saying and I think it's been more and more confirmed as people have gotten around Bo Nix Bo Nix also didn't have a single GM and only one head coach the Matt Eberflew show up to his pro day it was you know the second day of legal tampering it's obviously a reason why but you got I would imagine and if I was planning on taking Bo Nix in the first round, I'd find a way to at least get my head coach over there to, to see this guy in person. Yep, I agree. Um, I, I think those are the, the clear guys who went up and down. But we should talk about Michael Penix. Mm-hmm. Michael Penix was a clear riser and not surprising to anybody who is a fan of Michael Penix Jr. He definitely helped his stock a lot at the combine. He spun that ball. He put on a C.J. Stroud like kind of show with some of the throws he was making not quite that level but you know he's not that quite that prospect mm-hmm. pretty close though i mean he did what you you see the kid do you know in college where he could just throw the ball with velocity throw it with touch throw it deep throw it with timing the ball pops off his hand because he has a cannon he put on a great show throwing the football helped his stock more importantly he had clean medicals reportedly 
that, that yep. his medicals checked out very well. That was huge. And I think if he's cleared his medicals and he's, and now all you're looking at is, okay, you got a slightly older prospect at 24, but a fantastic passer. What you're kind of grappling with is where do I take him in the first round? Um, do I take him in the first round? Do I try to, do I try to play games and try to see if he gets to the second, which I think is unlikely. I know a lot of people still think he will go there. I have a very hard time seeing all these quarterback new teams passing up on a healthy, strong arm. Michael Penix who's as productive and as advanced as he is as a passer with good medicals. Um, but he put on a show. I think he, I think he largely cemented himself as a first round pick one way or another. I think that the odds are heavily favored that he's going to go in the first round. What do you think? It's so hard to tell, man, but I, I think he's, I think he's continuing to trend, trend that way. I think, uh, you know, medicals was a big obstacle. I agree. I think he, you no, know, he didn't have the perfect day like CJ Stroud did. Like CJ Stroud didn't miss a pass all day. That was like the, the model of models for how a pro day can go. But, you know, he threw like the tightest spiral that like some, some people have ever seen at the combine. He, he throws a beautiful ball and people got to see it in person. Um, I think that, I think there's going to be teams that fall in love with my, Michael Penix. I How don't, can you I don't, not? That's my I, question. How can you not? And I think something we talked about is I think people are going to continue to fall in love with the person that Michael Penix is. He's very well-spoken. He's a leader. He's smart. I think he did well on those whiteboards. I it's think, like a coach. Mm-hmm, He's like a coach on the field. And that's, you know, that's what they said when they brought, when they brought him over from in, Indiana, who was like having a coach um, installing that offense. So, um, Look, I don't think Michael Penix is going to be everybody's cup of tea. So, you know, there there is a world that if, you know, the few, if the few teams that need a quarterback that like him pass on him, he could fall. But, like, I think the reasons to pass on him are getting smaller and smaller. So, you know, it, you know we'll see. We'll see what happens. Um, I'm definitely leaning more now towards – Michael Penix going the first round over Bo Nix, even though I think Bo Nix fits more offenses. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I firmly agree with that. I always have. I want to get to a couple of things in the chat real quick while we're at it. So Sarge said a little earlier, did you guys see the athletic latest athletic mock draft that had the Giants trading with the Vikings? Vikings trade up to six and take JJ and Giants take all on at 12. I did not see that. I would absolutely jump off a bridge if that happened. Uh, so I hope that's not what happens. <laughs> Yeah. Um, K-, K Mac said, "Views on a second round quarterback, or is it a case of go get your guy in the first? <laughs> Definitely the latter, K Mac. Um, and we're going to get to this very shortly as we get through some of these players. The Giants are doing what's called pre spending. Um, the Athletic got into this. Uh, we might as well talk about it now. Actually, um, pre, you know what the Giants have done in free agency is and is really set up the roster to be ready to win." as soon as possible for a young quarterback. That's what they've done. They have established a defensive line that's ready to compete. They have a guy at the second level who's playing at a at a close to an elite level in Bobby Okereke and a young player who's coming up next to him in, in um, oh, I'm forgetting his Mike, name. Michael McFadden. Michael McFadden, who's playing very well with him as essentially his understudy. You have, you lost McKinney, but you still have a guy like Deontay Banks you have some pieces that are good in the secondary, and you're going to add to that. Your defense is close to being ready to compete right away. You just invested in the offensive line. You have Andrew Thomas, who you signed. You spent a, lar- a high pick on Evan Neal. Say what you want about it, but you did. And he's probably going to be valuable in some way, shape, or form, whether it's a guard or a tackle. You just brought in two solid guards. You've invested high draft ca- capital in wide receivers the last couple of years. Maybe not first round, but you had a second and a third round pick. You got Jalen Hyatt in the third last year. You got Wondell Robinson. They're both good players. Jerry Slayton is productive. You paid for Darren Waller. Whatever happens to him, I don't know. Um, you're going to obviously look to add a wide receiver in this class, most likely in the draft. This team is not as far from being ready to compete. You know, maybe not for Super Bowl, but compete for playoffs consistently in a division, as people think. This team is ready to have a young quarterback. They are prepaid. They are pre-invested for development to maximize the value of a rookie quarterback. Because as soon as you get a rookie quarterback, he's cheap for the next five years if you get him in the first round. And you can keep building that talent around him and you open that window to compete. So, no, I don't think we're going for a second-round quarterback. I think I hope we don't, at least. I think this team is set up for the Giants to take their swing right now in the first round on a quarterback. 
rumor has it they like four guys at least. I don't know who those four guys are. Everybody assumes they know who the four guys are. We don't know who their top four are. You know, it could be that could be that their top four are you know uh, JJ, Caleb, May, and Michael Penix, right? And not Jaden Daniels. You don't know like who what they value, yep. but they like reportedly. Who knows if it's true? But they like four guys. I think that it would be very unlikely that four guys are off the board, specifically their four guys are all off the board by pick six. I think they're going to take a swing and try to get up as high as possible to secure one of them. But I don't think that they're walking away from the first round, in my opinion, without a quarterback. They're ready to to do that. So that's my answer to that question. I wouldn't go for a second round quarterback. I take my swing right now. I would trade future draft capital, whatever it takes, get that guy if I have to, but or take him at six. Um, what do you think about the whole pre pre investing or whatever term they used? You know, yeah, I know. I think I think you you talked about it well. I think you summarized it well. I mean, I, I agree with the philosophy. If that's what they are doing, I hope that's what they're doing. I'll say to so talking about a quarterback in the second round. There's two things I'll say to that. I'll say one. If we are, to me, it better be Michael Penix or Bo Nix. I don't think any other quarterback is worth it. And I'm not a big Bo Nix guy, but it, he is he is the only he was a big gap after Bo Nix. He's I'm the last that. he's the last acceptable player at that position. Cor- correct. Even though I think don't think love him for our offense. I think there are offenses he would fit better in ours. Um and the other thing I will say, I don't think you trade away pick 39 if you're planning on get, getting a, a quarterback with a pick other than pick six, unless you're waiting to like round three, because if you are planning to take one early second or trade back in the first, I think you find a way to trade other picks to equal the value of 39 without trading away 39, because it's going to be a more challenging feat to go get your quarterback with from 47 than it was from 39. Um, I'll add, you know, uh, we had giant takes here basically asking um, why people are high on Rattler and mentioned <laughs> how, how slow of a 40 ran. Yeah, I guess another faller a little bit there with his 40 because he ran a slower 40 in Eli Manning. Not a not a great great sign. Slower, slower 40 in Cat Williams. Um, but um, I digress. Um, we talked about um, Spencer Rattler. Both of you, I believe, both of us, I believe, are in the opinion that he is a guy who can be a quality backup quarterback in the NFL. And if people, if teams try to push him into being a starter, at least anytime soon, like maybe if he plays out his full rookie contract and really de- like puts himself in position in this league where he's really developed on a good, well-coached team, he can get a chance one day. But I really see him as a as a backup quarterback in this league. And I think if they keep they somebody team commits to him there, I think he could succeed in. But if they try pushing him out into the field to become a starter, I think you'll see him burn out. Yeah. Very talented kid, Spencer Rattler. Always has been. But his problem has not been corrected largely, which is decision-making. He makes awful decisions. It's all his problems are up here. And through, what is it, four years of college now, you have not seen that dramatically improve. It's gotten better, but not significantly better. Um, he's a project. Spencer Rattler, for all his arm talent, and he has tremendous talent. He's a project. And I think, you know, he's, I probably wouldn't touch him on day two. I know somebody might take the swing on him, but I personally, I think he's a day three guy. He's the kind of guy that you take as a project. And I don't want him on day two, personally. I know people have made the claim for him so they can make a claim to say, let's go get Malik Neighbors. Malik Neighbors, as much as I love him as a player, does not move the needle for the Giants. If you believe we have to get a quarterback, and I think most people are at that point now, why wouldn't you take one of the more talented ones? Why would you take a lesser talent? You're in position to take one of the more talented guys. Just, you know, I think that's logical. Um, Will brings up uh, an interesting question or, you know, observation here. Um, And this is in response to the whole trade-up thing. Unless they end up trading Kayvon. Um, And that thought has crossed my mind since the Giants acquired Brian Burns. I don't think they will, Will. I really don't believe they're going to trade Kayvon Thibodeau. But. What if, and there's only one player I would trade Kayvon Thibodeau for, uh, and that would be to get my hands on Caleb Williams. I don't think I would necessarily move Kayvon Thibodeau when I could just use move draft capital to get you know anybody at pick three or later. Um, but what if Ryan Poles does make the pick available? He, you know, the door is not completely shut there yet. 
I think it's largely shut, but if he decides I'm going to trade the pick and he calls Joe Shane and says, okay, um, I want, I want your first for a couple of years and I want Kayvon Thibodeau. That's the deal. Do you say no to that as Joe Shane? If you can get him for pick swap in this year's first couple of firsts after that and cave on or pick swap next year's first cave on and next year's second. Do yeah. you say no? Yeah. If, if, if you have, yeah. I mean, if you think that he's a franchise, like elite level prospect, no, you don't, you don't say no. I mean, to the point of it is, you know, cave on Thibodeau is more valuable than the second and fifth that you trade away to get an upgrade in Brian Burns, you know, I do want to see us continue to build around the defense. We've talked about it with, you know, I think building around Dexter Lawrence, who is a, a difference maker. And I think bring having guys like Kayvon and Brian Burns does that, but you know, quarter, the quarterback is the exception to all of these things. So if, if, if it means getting the guy that, that you love and you think can bring you to Super Bowls, you do it. That's, that's to me, it's that. I simple. mean, I, I think I would personally only do it for Caleb Williams in this particular class and this scenario because the, the the commanders are not trading us a second pick, so it's either the it's either Caleb Williams or whoever's at three, mm-hmm. right? And, and I don't know if and, I'm I, yeah I don't know if I'm giving up Kayvon for the third pick from six, you know? Yeah, Unless, only because like, I, I can get there with draft picks um, in a more easy. That's scenario. my thought. Unless yeah. they're saying like I'm not considering doing this unless like you cave on or like, don't even talk to me or something Then maybe we can talk, but yeah, I hear you. Yeah. Um, no, it's, it's a great thought. And I think it's something that may play out, but ultimately I don't think it will. I think, I think that the giants are very comfortable at six, taking a quarterback or moving up. And I think they have preloaded this team enough where they can actually start competing depending on how they do this. The, in the ideal world, you know, I know people want, you know, people want certain players, but in the ideal world, the guy they want or a couple, one of the guys they want gets to them at six. They don't have to maneuver up the board. They don't have to give up any more draft capital and off you go. Um, so I think that that's how I would handle that whole, that whole quarterback issue. Um, let's wanna... go to, yeah, let's go through some more of these players just quickly. So yeah, let's just fire um, through some of these positions. Yeah. So three running backs that really showed out well at the combine by now you guys have heard of them. You've heard of them on this show sometimes. And some you have not. Uh, Trey Brenson put on an absolute RAS show at the combine. Ran a four three nine forty. Had a nine point seven overall RAS score. Freak athlete, powerful runner, one of the better backs. He was our he was our running back one coming into yep. the season. His stock fell in the eyes of a lot of people for a little bit, but I think at the end of the day, you have an amazing talent there. He showed out. And I think his stock is right back up. I think he's going to go in the early third round, if I had to guess. I wouldn't be shocked if somebody swung on him in the second round. I really wouldn't be. But um, I think most likely he's going top of the third. Jalen Wright ran a 4.3840, the speedster from Tennessee. Jumped a 38-inch vertical and put on a 9.8 RAS score composite. Incredible athletic testing. Watch the kid on film. He's explosive. Explosive, explosive, explosive. He's a he's just a burster. Through the, through the middle of the field, runs. He, he's just a home run hitter. You know, and he's a pretty good all around back, but his 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 game is home run hitting. Yeah, and um, I think worth mentioning for you know for us is that he's a really good pass protector. And yep. if you're bringing a, a rookie quarterback, that's something important to get these guys in the field. So the reason Eric Gray couldn't get on the field his entire rookie year, he, he is one of the best, if not the best, pass protector in the draft. So that's worth mentioning. But the kid who stole the show for the running backs in terms of athletic testing was a, everybody's talking about him, but he doesn't even start. <laughs> on yeah. the team he's on is uh Isaac Gorendo from Louisville. So six feet tall, 221 pounds, ran a 4-3-3-40, which is that's just ludicrous speed for a running back. Yeah. Almost that's ludicrous 42. speed for anybody. Yeah. Yeah. Um 41 and a half inch vertical, 6.94 three cone, and 9.97 composite RAS score, near perfect testing, just a crazy athlete. Um, and everybody's talking about him. There's a lot of buzz, but not a guy that you know was was highly viewed coming into the draft. Though, if you look, you know, he's, he didn't have a ton of attempts. I think he had 132 total attempts this year because he was. I think he got second fiddle uh, usage in Louisville. But I mean, if you look at his data, did you did you check out his advanced stats? His I have. So he had a 90.3 rushing grade 
an 84.2 zone rushing grade, an 86.9 gap grade. He had an elusive rating of 106.8. That's a new metric of theirs, which was, you know, top, top like 15 percentile or so. And a yards after contact per attempt of 4.11, which is elite. He had 88 zone attempts, 43 gap attempts. He had 543 yards after contact. And for the number of, you know, for the number of, of rushes he had, that's pretty damn good. 31 forced missed tackles, 14 explosive plays of 15 plus yards. And he had 1.7 yards per route run as a receiver with only one drop. So his metrics are pretty ridiculous. He had 22 receptions on 24 targets. He had 234 yards on the ground, eight, I mean, in the air, 810 yards in the, on the ground on 132 attempts. So about six yards to carry. Um, maybe there's something here. I don't know. What, what, what did you take of him? I mean, I know I saw some people who were decently high on this kid going into um, the combine. And that was before he tested. Like they knew he was a good athlete, but you know, thought this guy could be an under, under the radar guy. So this is what I love about the combine. That this is exactly it. Is that you know, I'm not going to sit here and raise this guy up and make him a top five running back for me because he tested off the charts. But what I am gonna do is I'm going to see that. I'm gonna go, I would have probably never looked at this kid otherwise, but now I am going to go look and I'll watch film on him. And we'll see. I'll see what I what I like about him. And I'll come back to you guys and let you guys know what I think. But you no, know, the, these type of guys are are why we pay attention to the combine. They're guys who put themselves on the map, and it's worth going back. And so we said when we did our combine preview, we said we want to look for validation of players that we we thought were really good on tape. Make sure that their athletic testing matched it. Um, look for outliers, but mainly. You know, we wanted to find guys who stood out, who we really weren't paying attention to and say, OK, that got my attention. Now I'm going to go back and look at the tape and review this guy and see, is this real? So to be honest, I have not gone back and looked at Gorendo yet, been doing other things. But he's a guy that I'm going to look at before we put together our big board, um, because that type of testing is elite. And when you look at his, at least from PFF advanced metric standpoint, some of these metrics are through just they're just off the chart the 4.11 yards after contact is incredible and the fact that he's got this incredible elusive grade I mean, it makes you think that this is a guy that can take contact move on and be elusive as a runner with that kind of athleticism i think you have to start paying attention to it he could be a quick riser if people go back and see that his film is good but uh, uh to be honest folks i have not looked at it very carefully um and uh yeah you know I'll give you two fallers as well that from this combine um, at running back. And it's two guys we like, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Maybe could mm -hmm. fall into our laps. Mm -hmm. One is my guy. Does not does not change anything for me. He is still my, my running back one. But Bucky Irving did not have a good combine. He had a 2.11 RAS score. Um, you know, a lot of that was the size. He did not. He's not a big guy. He's you know, 5'8", 192 pounds. So that that hurts his RAS scores. He was not explosive. He only jumped 29 and a half inches, um, nine nine feet seven inches in the broad. And then he ran okay. He ran like a four five five. Look, I I said this when we did the preview, and the stats kind of backed it up a little bit. I don't think running backs a position where these the testing matters as much as some of these others i think this is one where you know it's all it's it's about tape it's about um these guys instincts and i've seen all the tape i need to see on buck irving he is he can make he's extremely agile can make you miss in a uh, phone booth he's a great receiver you know you can see guys like good example is devin singletary who just signed had a terrible combine you can see a guy like Kyron Williams had a terrible combine. He kind of fits the mold of these guys a little bit. I'm so high on Buck Irving, but that could fall, cause him to fall. He's a guy with a good combine who, with his skill set, really could have maybe could have pushed himself in the second round. But I think he's pushed him down to the fourth, potentially even farther. Um, the other guy, Audra Gestime. You know, we talked about him earlier. I, ironic, um, it's these two. But go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So we were we literally argued these guys in our last mock draft. Um. You know, was good in a lot of areas. He did have a 6.51 uh, RES score, you know, 5'11", 221, 23 reps in bench, 38-inch vertical, very, very good. 10-foot, 5-inch broad, again, very, very good. 
but went out and ran a 4-7 40-yard dash. And not only ran a 4-7, ran a 1-6-9 10-yard split, which is yeah, even worse than a 4-7. Yeah. Um, look, not good. Um, but I, again, trust the tape. You know, he's still explosive. You see that in the tape. Look, he doesn't have the long speed. I don't think we ever really thought he had the long speed. That that ten yard split is a little bit worrisome to me because that's like, you know, sometimes you got to have thresholds, and I don't think he's going to hit some people's thresholds. I might do a deeper dive into like, you know, that ten yard split and where it f- fell historically. But look, Audrey Gesme again. I'll just kind of talk about Bo Nix. He fourth, fifth round pick now, like that. That forty is going to make him drop. Um, yeah, and. We invested in running back, man. So, you know, we just need either one of these guys to be like a second running back for us. So be both of, the of them are going to fall. Yeah, I mean, that 10-yard split does matter. I think when we did our preview of the combine and we talked about the, the metrics that matter by position group, for running backs, the 10-yard split was one of the most important things, um, as were some none of the them, explosive metrics. Yeah, none of them were super predictive compared to some of the other positions, but it was still one of the more predictive. Right. And I think that is concerning when you see a number like that. That said, the tape doesn't lie on the type of player he is. He's a power rusher. Um, Do you need to be as explosive in the 10 yard split for a player like him? I don't know. I'm not really sure you need to because of the way he plays football. Um, The way I look at it is just the way you described it. With him and Bucky Irving, two guys who clearly on tape at high levels of competition showed out. I'm confident that if I took one of them, they'll be good players. What I'm looking at these numbers as is value because teams are going to, they're going to overthink this. They're going to look at this and say, Oh, I don't know if this guy's going to translate to the NFL right or wrong. There's a good chance. These guys fall into the middle of day three. And if they do, you can pounce on them. So the giants might've been able to push their running back need down to the fifth round. You know, it's possible. Like they may not play that game. They may go third round. They may go fourth round. But there's a chance that they're going to say there's enough of these guys out there in the fifth round that we could add to our room, especially if Estime and, and Bucky Irving fall a little bit, where they take the chance on it. Um, now, you know, there's a chance that, like, somebody just brought up that will they test differently at the pro day? Um, they might, right? Not, sometimes these guys, they don't run. They don't run really well when it comes to running the 40 because you have to run it in a precise straight line. There's a whole training to it, and some guys can't do it. Like, you saw a guy like um, you saw the other Notre Dame player, the one well, Kyle Hamilton, a couple of years mm-hmm. ago, tested awful, like horrendous testing, and he was pound for pound the best player in the draft class, and he's an All Pro now at safety. But he, his he, speed popped on tape too. His speed popped on tape, but he couldn't. You know, when they you know they looked at him, they're like he was running kind of zigzag. I don't know what his, his issue is, but he couldn't run the 40 and it hurt him. So maybe there's something like that with these guys. Maybe they don't, some guys don't test well, but if they look good on tape, I think you take a swing, you just might get value on them. So those are interesting guys to watch and see where they land. And um, I'll say one thing maybe worth looking into with, with, uh, with Audra Gastme. And I haven't done like looked at it closely, but bad 10 yard split. Um, and like, like really bad. Could it just be that he had a really, he's really not good at start coming out of a starting stance? That's possible. It, it is possible. And that's something where the tape should tell you, you know, what you really need to know. All these players were GPS trackers, you know, on, on the field. So NFL teams have actual real-time data on how they play with a football in their hand. And they'll be able to put their data up relative to other players. So I think they'll have that answer. But there's no doubt that there are GMs who still draft based on these numbers. I mean, a guy like Chris Ballard essentially will not draft you unless you have like a 9.5 or greater RAS score. <laughs> like it's pretty clear. So, you know, the, it does affect draft stock somehow. So it's interesting to see where they land. Um, we should go on quickly to the most impressive group at the combine. Not surprisingly, the wide receivers. They put on a show. This class is absolutely loaded. We knew that going in, but Boy, did they put on an athletic testing show. Um, so let's start with a guy who kind of impressed people the most. A.D. Mitchell from Texas. Six foot two, 205 pounds. We've talked about him before. We actually took him in our mock draft, I think, our, our most recent mock draft of the Giants in the second round. That's when we had a 39 overall pick. Um, he ran a 4-3-4-40. Four, four, 
Well, we took him at 47. Oh, did we? Okay. Uh, he ran a 43, 440. He had a 39 and a half inch vertical and a 9.99 composite RAS score. Uh, just blew up the combine, went full DK Metcalf on it, you know, in terms of testing. Um, I think this athletic testing matches the tape. He is explosive. He is fast. He is strong. All of those things are true. Is he a good receiver is the question. What do you think about A.D. Mitchell? About him as a receiver? The whole package. Yeah, I mean, I think he's a, I think he's a freaky athlete, man. I think as far as an athlete goes, like, you do not see people as tall as A.D. Mitchell move like A.D. Mitchell. I was actually, I was doing some film watching in some of these you know, second round I receivers the other day, and I'll say, like, the way he moves at a guy as big as he is, just like in and out of his breaks, the route runner he is for how big he's so ridiculously impressive. Um, you know, he's not as consistent as I'd like him to be. Um, he is a body catcher. That worries me. Um, but I I mean, I also see him make a spectacular catcher in there, but he definitely defaults to the body catch, um, which you know, worries me for a bigger guy, but he's like, it's just so impressive the amount of like space he can generate with his routes for a guy that as is as big as he is, is just so rare. So I'm torn on him, but I think he has as much potential as basically anybody in this class. And he's a good route runner. You know, for a guy his size, he's a pretty good route runner. Yep. Um, so I, I mean, I appreciate that. I think he's probably pushing him into the first round. You know, he's he's being viewed as a back end of the first round, early second kind of guy right now. Uh, don't think he will be in the Giants range. It's unlikely he falls to 47. Stranger things have happened. But I think at this point, he's looking at like going somewhere between tw- picks 20 and 40, that range. I think that's likely where he lands. Uh, Roma Dunze, 6'3", 212 pounds out of Washington. 4'4", 540, 39-inch vertical another 9.92 composite RAS score. Roma Dunze is widely believed to be a top 10 pick, either wide receiver two or three, depending on who you talk, who you listen to. Um, definitely in play for the Giants at pick six if they decide not to go quarterback. So what did you think of Roma Dunze? I mean, he put on a show and put up a, what did you just say, a, uh, a 9.92 RAS and he ran slower than we thought he would in the 40. I mean, there is there is no question. This guy is a total freak show. And, you know, I think one of my, my favorite story that came out of these wide receivers from the combine was that after he was the last guy left on the field um, during the wide receiver workouts because he wanted to get a 6'6 three cone. So he just kept running it and he kept messing up and accidentally like, hitting the cone coming around and he wasn't able to get it. You just, you know, they run those things at the end of the day. They really should move those up. But um, it just shows like, the type of person Roma Dunze is. He's a competitor and he, it meant so much for him just to get that time. He couldn't leave the field. So he did. Yeah. The guy, the guy's a baller shows up on the field, on the, on the tape. He's incredible. Um, I would be upset if we didn't take a quarterback, but if there was some other plan in place and we landed Roma Dunze, I mean, it's hard to be upset with a talent like that being added to your team. I think the guys, he's got a a high, high caliber NFL career ahead of him. I have very little doubt about that. A um, couple other guys worth mentioning from the receiver room that kind of tested out and showed out. One of our favorites, Lad McConkey from Georgia. Uh, we knew that he was a great route runner, route running specialist. We knew he's a good blocker. We knew that he's just a good all-around player. But, oh, boy, did Lad McConkey show up. What did he run, a 4-3-4? He ran a let, – let me pull it up. A 4 I think he ran a 4 3, nine, I think. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, he ran a 4 3, nine. And then his pro day was the other day. He ran a six seven two three cone and a four oh four short shuttle. Absolutely ridiculous athletic El- numbers. That's elite testing numbers. Yes. And so like, yes, we knew he was a good athlete, but he showed to be an elite athlete. So, you know, pair that with how over refined and like efficient a player he was already. He's I got to do all my film work still to like solidify my ranking, but it would not surprise me if Larry McConkie ended up in the top five wide receiver for me in this draft. 
No, not yeah. at all. We, I mean, we like the, we like those route runners. That fits yeah. our prototype. Yeah, I mean, Monty and I are definitely biased towards route runners. Last year, both of us had Jordan Addison as our favorite receiver in the class. You know, JSN uh, right up there. Yep. Um, it translates. Guys who run routes and who have a diverse route tree, who not only run precise routes with a wide with with a full route tree, but run nuanced routes. You know, guys who can actually bend the route tree just enough when they sense where the pre- where the where the defender is to give their quarterback the best possible throwing window they can. Those guys are going to translate. They're special. Uh, Jordan Addison was one of those guys. We loved him. It's not a surprise to me that Jordan Addison had a really solid first-year campaign in the NFL. McConkey, yeah, the McConkey Cooper Cup, uh, you know, their comparisons are definitely going to come in as a big slot who can run great rounds. It's not a terrible comp at all. Um, there's some other comps for McConkey, the way he runs. I mean, there's Stephon, there's a little Stephon Diggs in him. I, I saw someone call him Steve Smith, a taller yeah. Steve Smith senior. I mean, a guy like him, you just put him into an NFL offense and say, run the, run, what kind of routes do you run? You can run every route. It opens up your offense, and he gets to stay on the field longer, right? So you always want to bet on these guys. I was kind of hoping he would fall to the 40s. Forget it now. Like, this guy's going – He's. I'd be shocked if he's not a first-round pick. I really would be shocked if he's not a first-round yep. pick. And, and K-Mac asked, asked if he'd fit the Giants, and I, I say yes. They, they like, like separators. That, yeah. that that's fits their model. Like, is he a traditional X? No. Do I think every team needs a traditional X? Also, no. Like, I don't think he is like offset by Wandale Robinson, if that's like what you're asking. I think he's inside outside versatility. But you might have been also, yeah. Yep. Um, you know, some other guys, Sal, who I mean, because we could go on and on, but I'll just keep going. Xavier Worthy broke the the record for fastest four. He ran a four two one. Yeah. Four to one, yep. right on the official yep. time. Yeah, the official time, and we, it's the one guy we said when in our combine preview. We said there's one guy who we could see breaking the four twos. I think I said a four two eight. I yeah. I definitely shorted him. He ran a four two one. Brian Thomas Jr. He ran a four three three at at what 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 did he weigh in at? He's like um, he's like, like two twenty something, isn't he? Yeah, or says saying two oh nine six three two oh nine, but still. Okay. Four three three. Um, Tez Walker four three six. Xavier Leggett four three nine. Roman Wilson four three nine. Troy Franklin four four one. Ricky Parasel four four one. Like it, it goes on and on and on. Oh, and also shout out. I wanted I wanted to put out a shout out one guy here because it's your guy, Malik Washington had a great day. Malik Washington ran a four four seven. I don't lie to he you had, guys. <laughs> he had a one. He had a one five three ten yard split. And he jumped 42 and a half inches, a 10 6 broad jump, and he benched 19 reps, 19 at his at, at, at five, eight and a half, 191 pounds. So shout out your guy, Malik Washington. With 30 inch arms. I think he had like 30 and a half inch arms. That matters. That matters. You got it. You got over the 30 mark. Everybody focuses, oh, he's 5'8, he's 5'7. If you have 30 inch arms, and you have a vertical that's like that, and you show it on tape that you can run good routes, you can actually position your body well on receptions, and you get up there for the catch point, and you shield defenders, which is what Malik Washington does, even though he's primarily a slot receiver, you can succeed in the NFL. Malik Washington is the most slept-on receiver in this entire class. I, I cannot believe he, get, he doesn't get more love. He, For those of you who have not seen him yet, I've been talking about him a lot, go watch his tape. He's a University of Virginia receiver. He is, I think, a sixth-year player, maybe a fifth-year player. Um, he was a transfer. Uh, I think he was at Illinois before, if I'm not mistaken, or some some other school. But absolutely blew up. He runs great routes. He's strong. He's 5'8", five, 5'8", five or so, but he is strong. He's got a strong frame. He runs people over. Yes, Malik Washington. Um this guy is fantastic. And yes, we have Wendell Robinson, but he's just a good football player. If the mm-hmm. cards line up where he's there to take and he's the best player, just take him. Add him to your receiver room. You know, he's a good football player. And especially if you didn't get a chance to address wide receiver earlier, if we miss out I, in the second round or something. Yep. I mean, it, it's just, it's incredible to me that he is not being sought after more. But you know who likes Malik Washington? Did you see this? Did you see who actually likes him? No, I didn't say. Will McClay likes Malik Washington. <laughs> you, oh, yeah, you and Will McClay like the same people. That's right. Apparently, Will McClay and I have a lot in common when it comes to the way the kind of players we like. According to our, our buddy Matt, who's a Cowboys 
Cowboys content creator, good dude. Um, he loves Will, Malik Washington, uh, and he's surprised that nobody else is loving him as much as he is. You know who else Will McClay loves, apparently? Ben Sinat. <laughs> ben Sinat. Ben Sinat. We got it. Can we talk about Ben Sinat, please? Ben Sinat he, blew up the freaking combine, dude. Yep. He Can did. You pull up his, do you have his numbers? Uh, like, yeah, let me, let, me, let me pull it up. Hang on. So Ben had a 40-inch vertical. I think he 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 measured in at six. What is it? Six five or six six? Two hundred and thirty. Six four. Two hundred and fifty pounds. Thirty two okay. and th- uh, three eighth arms. He ran a four six eight. A one five nine ten yard split. Jumped forty inches vertical jump. Ten six broad jump. A six eight two three 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 cone drill. Significantly under seven seconds. And a four two three twenty yard shuttle. I've been telling you guys about Benson out since I don't know when. He's legit. An end up set. Yeah, yeah. Bensonot is the real deal. Zero star recruit my ass. Bensonot is a football player. That dude is a great route runner. He's a damn good blocker. He is clearly a very good athlete. He catches the ball well. He shields the ball well. He's a quarterback's best friend. He can line up as a fullback. He can line up as an H back. He can line up in line. He's a do-it-all kind of tight end. Is he an elite athlete, elite tight end? No, probably. I wouldn't view him that way. But is he a Daniel Bellinger mold guy with a little bit more juice in the passing game and maybe a little bit less juice as a, as a blocker? Yes, that's what he is. I think he'd be awesome on this team, man. Add him to Daniel Bellinger. I think you got a nice two tight end rotation right there. So Ben Sinat blew up the combine, too. I loved it. Uh, the guy who blew up the combine the most from the tight ends, we'd be remiss for not mentioning it, is the kid from Penn State. Uh, yep. Mm-hmm. Th- those, t- those two are the ones I think are the ones worth messaging. Ben Sinat and then, yeah, Theo Johnson. As as Penn State tight ends do. I mean, last year we had Kuntz, who was you know a former Penn State tight end. We had Before he went to Old- Mike Gisecki. Mm-hmm. Yep, we had we it's a, they, every single year it seems. Didn't like, Pat yeah, Fryer both have a really good testing? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So, so yep he he ran. I'll give it at six six two hundred and sixty pounds, thirty three inch arms, ten and one fourth inch hands. He ran a four five seven, a one five five split, thirty nine and a half inch vertical, less than Ben Sinat. Ten five broad jump, less than Ben Sinat. Seven one five three cone drill, much worse than Ben Sinat. <laughs> and a four one nine twenty yard shuttle better than Benson. Yeah, <laughs> they're they're both crazy. they're both very good athletes. They're both very good athletes and good football players. And I don't know where these guys are going. Tight ends are tough to come by. I have a feeling that they might sneak into the third round, maybe the fourth round, somewhere in there. I don't think they're going in the second, but who knows? You know, you never know. Um, so. Those are your position players on offense that did really well at the combine. They kind of blew it up. It was a, it was a fun combine, man. Like these kids really came in ready to, to test. I, I, and I, not to be the downer, but I wanted to give you a couple fallers from those two groups. Unfortunately, I, I think Sarge wanted us to talk up his boy here, uh, Dol- Dolan Holker, who was my, my guy from our tight end episode. And I'll say shout out Dolan Holker. If you look it up from the combine, you did have one one uh, highlight from the, the combine where he finishes the gauntlet drill and he thought he caught the last ball and he's running up field with the ball and they throw him another because he didn't realize it another one and he one hands the other one and he runs to the finish line with two balls in his hand. That was pretty cool. With that said, at 6'3", only 241 pounds, very light. He ran the worst 40 of every tight end with a 4'7'8" um 32 and a half inch verticals fine he did run a good three cone of six eight three but yeah four seven eight at 240 pounds is is not great um the the two i wanted to point out wide receiver before we move off these skill players totally um i would be remiss to not or mention keon coleman a guy at one point people thought could be like a, a four three guy people were hyping him up to i know like Dane Brugler said, comped him to uh, uh, De- uh, Deont- or Darius Thomas. Is that the Bull Broncos Demar- wide receiver? Dem- Dem- Demarius Thomas. Dem- yeah. Demarius Thomas. Thank you. Demarius Thomas. And he ran a 4 6 1. So, and granted, his GPS numbers were fantastic throughout the entire combine. It's something to keep in mind. 
Um, his long speed's not good though. Um, he had the, he had the, I think he had the fastest top speed of any receiver though. He did. He did throughout the uh, or during the drills while they did the gauntlets and stuff. He had the best speed. Mm-hmm. And speaking of gauntlets, another guy who fell a little bit, a, a guy I'm a big fan of, um, Troy Franklin. He first of all ran a four four one. Good, plenty good time. But with how much these other guys showed out as freaks. Or, and how fast we think Troy Franklin is, it's kind of like Jalen Hyatt last year. Like, you expected better. It hurts him a little bit because I thought he was, like, faster than that. And then the other thing is he might have ran the worst gauntlet drill I've ever seen in my entire life. He was running, like, like, like S's on it. Like, it was it was awful. It was It's like he never ran a gauntlet drill in his entire life. It was his first time doing it. Really bad. So, yeah, those are my two fallers from, from the wide receiver group. Yeah, I mean they're still good players. Um, I, 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 I agree. Still, uh, yeah, I would still probably take them, but yes, they definitely. I agree. I would it. still take both at forty-seven. I would take either yeah. of them. Yep, and you know, to be honest, Xavier Leggett's a guy that really had a good combine, um, but there was a little bit of prejudice coming in because he measured in the Senior Bowl at six-one and not six-three, uh, as people thought, and he had uh, nine-inch hands or nine and a half-inch hands as opposed to whatever they thought he would have. Um, Leggett really is a guy that plays big he plays bigger than his height would show on measurement and he had a great combine but i think that that prejudice coming from the measurement of his overall height which i think is kind of silly is dampening his stock mm-hmm. the get is a guy that i i did some more research he was a guy we talked about who had a really great year in south carolina but it was his first good year he had some pretty awful years for the four years before that mm-hmm. um but when you actually dig into his past, there are reasons for that. I think Brett Coleman did a deep dive into it. I don't know if you saw that, you know, I didn't, but it, you that's know, important. Like, it's important when, when there's something so off about like somebody's profile that there's context for it. That's an important. Yeah, I mean, the context has to be like where, how he was used in other offenses, the instability of, you know, coaches constantly changing on him, you know, transferring things like that, where he just never got his footing until this year. So that made me feel better that, Hey, Leggett is a guy that, it's not a freak. Like it's not, it's not a fluke kind of incident. I think this guy's legit and his testing showed it somehow though. He's still not being talked about as like a top 30 guy. There's a chance to get is there at 47. I don't think it's a crazy chance. I think it's kind of 50, no. 50 that he's there at 47. And he's I, a guy that, you know, I would, I would take a swing at it. I've seen talks on him drop into the third round. So I, yeah, I'd be, I, I would be there for giant six here said like he had D, D, DK comps and be honest with you. I still comp him to DK. DK. He's a shorter DK, but he plays exactly plays like DK big. Metcalf. Yeah, but he plays with big, speed. Big, fast, and I, strong. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He's just a little bit shorter, but he plays like DK, DK Metcalf. All right. Um, we, we well, so through- Kevin, well, I'll just say what well, Kevin said. Run the card up. You know what I would do? If, if my intelligence at 47 told me that I could get this guy at 60, and there's some good players on the board, and I really want him. I might actually okay. trade down. Yeah, this is this yeah, is a scenario where I would trade down. How many down. wide receivers? If there's still a bunch left, still, I'm I'm okay with missing out on Xavier Leggett. There's still so four, many receivers in this class. Roman, look um, for the look for the Giants to depending on who's on the board. Look for them to consider the trading down at that spot at 47 because Joe Shane did that in 2022. He he obviously targeted a few guys and he traded down until he was comfortable. Got a couple of extra day three picks and picked up his guy so that's something i'd be looking out for that that trade down might be the difference between getting a guy like ben Tanot or an audrey guesstimate or not you know so mm-hmm. anyway i'm sorry go ahead no you're good um i'm just saying we're we're starting to run low on time so i, I was thinking i was just kind of gonna give you some risers and fallers for each of the last positions and you can just give us some quick thoughts on that you have on any of the guys and we'll just kind of fire through the rest here Is that was that work for you fine by me all right so I'll give you go to offensive line. Um, you know, shout out uh Dable Connection uh guy Tanner Borlini from Wisconsin. Justin Penick <laughs> said said was the worst guy the first day of the senior bowl that um, he's ever yep. seen. Yep. Um that he's he ever a, seen. He ran a four nine four forty yard dash and he like set and he like ran one of the best three cones they've they ever seen in like combine history he ran like a jason kelsey like three cone so shout out tanner bordellini brandon coleman guard from tcu had a really good day roger rosengarden uh ran a 492 he's he's a guy we were poorly looking at um christian haynes had a pretty good day cooper bb 
you know, for all the shit we gave him, he, he tested really well for, you know, I don't necessarily always see it on tape, but for a guy as big as he is, he did test well. He ran a five, five, uh, five Oh three. Um, our boy, Troy Fontenot, he tested solidly, but also like was the best performer in, in the, uh, the drills in, yeah. in the drills. And so was, uh, you know, I'm still not huge on Fuaga, but Fuaga was, uh, tested really well in those two. So for those risers, any thoughts on any of those guys? Yeah. So, I mean, obviously Fuaga is going to go in the top 15 and Fontenot may go in the top 15, top 20. I think those guys we know are good. Um, the interesting ones here are Bordellini and Rosengarten. So we've talked about Rosengarten before. He was the right tackle at Washington, protected the blind side of Michael Penix Jr. Very good pass blocker. Not as good as a run blocker. Got his lunch taken from him against Michigan, but then again, who didn't? Um, but he tested well, and we had talked about that metric, right? That four nine threshold for for offensive linemen, and guys who get to four nine or better tend to have outstanding NFL careers. It's a weird threshold, especially the tackles, right? Especially those tackles for a right tackle who's being viewed as like a day two, day three guy to run a four nine two, who actually had a pretty good college career, not great but good. That's something you have to pay attention to, you know, and that's a value player. I, that's a guy I'd be watching, you know, like to me, I'm paying close attention to where he falls in the draft, and, and there's probably a point in the draft in which I pull the trigger on him. Bordellini had bad tape. Bordellini was bad at the senior bowl. He looks poorly coached. We've talked about this. I don't like his coach. It's the same coach that gave us Josh Azudu and, mm-hmm. and Marcus McKeithen, uh, who has been since demoted in, in Wisconsin. But Bordellini's testing was was elite. And that's a ball of clay. I don't know where he's going. But again, he's another guy that he's there day three as an interior lineman. You might take a shot at a guy like that. Um, To me, he's more of a guy that goes to more established offensive line coaches like the Callahan's of the world. You know, they take a guy like him and they, and they, or, you know, the Stoutlands. But why not? You know, if he's available. So those are the guys that I kind of noticed. Obviously, Christian Haynes, we thought would test well. He did well. He's going to, I think I have a hard time seeing him fall out of the early third round. You know, he may be there for our third round pick, but I think more likely late second, early third, somewhere in there. Uh, but that's kind of what I thought about it. Nothing too crazy, but but Rosengarten and Bordellini were interesting, especially Bordellini with that 492. Yeah. I mean, no, Rosengarten with the 492. Very, very Jason Kelsey type number. So it's so interesting if somebody wants to take a shot on, on hate when the Eagles take him and, and he's going to he's, he's gonna be an Eagle. I, I fear yep. it. Like I can see Stoutland saying, give me that guy, I'll fix him. Yep. Um, the only, the only faller, I really, nobody formed that poorly. If I was going to do a faller, I'd probably say Marius Mims. You know, he only jumped like 25 and a half inches and he pulled a hammy, I think, or something like that. So he didn't really participate in any drills. He does. And, yeah. He's only, he's, I think he's only, he's only played like 12 total games in college. Yeah. He's, he's been hurt and he's, uh, I know he's an athletic freak who people are betting on the upside and he didn't get to show his upside. So, um, you know, that hurts him, but, um, I, I don't think anybody really o- overly disappointed. Um, no. want to jump in the edge group. Yep. You go there real quick. Um, Dallas Turner ran a four, four, six jumped over 40 inches, you know, total freak drop Robinson four, four, eight. Um, he had one of the, like the best 10 yard splits we've seen this guy. That pops on tape, guys. An incredible first step. Um, he jumped his, his broad jump was insane too, if I recall. Yes, he had he had a he had a ten eight broad jump. Um, and then uh, Jared Verse tested extremely well. Jared Verse is like the typical what you look for. He tested the Kavons, the JVN Clownies, the Mile Garretts. Like he's right up there with all those top guys. He tested just like them. Um. You know, Chris Braswell, uh, he had a four six. He didn't test quite as well as we thought, but do end do ended up having a seven foot wingspan. So that was pretty crazy. Um, shout out late to Latu. You know, we never thought this guy was gonna come in and be a freak, and he wasn't, but he can ran a four six four and like he's not not a top prospect because we expect him to be a four six four guy. We he's a top prospect because he is the most refined pass rusher in this class. His right, medicals came back good, yeah. which is another yep. huge thing. So, yep. um, and that that's really my my main guys there. Do you have do you have anything on any of those guys? No, I I think there wasn't much there to be honest. With the addition of Brian Burns, I'm not even looking at that room right now. 
Yeah, I'll I'll say for some fallers, I'll say. Um, well, you didn't mention Darius Robinson. He tested well. Um, yeah, if I recall. yeah. So he tested well. He ran like a four. So this is the issue: if you consider him an edge, like then he didn't test that well. But if you think he's going to be a three tech, like who can maybe do edge, like we've been saying, then he tested he, very well. He's a three tech. He's a, he's a three tech slash four eye. Like that's his. That's yeah. what he will be best at at the NFL, in my opinion. I've been saying that for a while. He's a defensive end in a three four scheme. You know, um, that's where he would do well. So in that role, then, he'd be great. Then in that case, like him and Brand Dorless tested well for those roles. Um, uh, the guys who I didn't think tested super well is Austin Booker. I know from Kansas, people were really high on him. He was supposed to be a riser. He ran a four seven nine. Braylon Trice is um, he was the interesting one in the combine. He clearly, clearly shedded weight to try to run a good to get a good testing. He got he's this guy who's supposedly in two seventies. He got all the way down to two forty five. Um, he he ran a four seven two, so it didn't even really pay off that much for him. Uh, so you know, but I I saw Jan- Daniel Jeremiah. I think made a good point. He's like, look, like like we know that's not his weight, and we right. know that that's not a great number, and it's not real. But it's like you gotta love a guy who has that type of commitment to shed all that weight just to run a good time to prove like he can be the guy. So people were freaking about him, his weight loss. And I was like, the dude is Samoan. Like yeah. I'm not worried about the Samoan guy being able to pack on some pounds later on. He'll be fine. He'll get back up to his weight. Um, so I move on to defensive lineman. Sure. Uh, Braylon Fisk. That, that, I think that was the star of the day. That's uh that's Ivan's guy from uh Florida state. Ran a four, seven, eight, one, six, eight, uh, 10 yard split. 33 and a half uh, vertical jump. He had a, a 9.9 broad jump, a 4.37 20 yard shuttle, and 26 reps on the bench. Absolutely blew up the day for you know a guy who is a defensive line, like an interior defensive lineman, 6'4", 292 pounds. Like this is another guy who I could easily see you know be that like three tech for us. Um, you know. Chris Jenkins, you know, he didn't maybe have the day that we hoped he would have, but he had a pretty good day. 491, um, 478, 20 yard shell. Didn't run the three cone. Hmm, suspicious. Um, <laughs> the, uh, 30 inch broad jump, 97, uh, or 30 inch vertical jump, 97 broad jump, 29 inch reps on the bench. All that's really good. Um, you know, Bry- Byron Murphy, a 487, Ruka Roro, a 489. Um, trying to see if there's anybody who really, uh, L- Leonard Taylor, I would say is probably the faller, um, ran a, a ran a five twelve as somebody who we kind of looked at as an athlete and like as an upside guy, who's a freak, um, five twelve only jumped 30 inches, a seven, eight, one, three cone. Um, so that's probably my faller. What do you what do you think about those risers and fallers for this? Yeah, I mean nothing too surprising. There was nothing too surprising in that. Um mm. I think the Leonard Taylor one sticks out as the yeah. guy who like I thought would really blow up the combine. And he fell. And yep. I love it because there's no way that guy's not an athletic freak. I, I don't know what he was doing on, on the combine day, but Leonard Taylor later in the draft for, you know, to take as a project with his 18% pass rush win rate from the interior, which is bananas. Give me that guy. You know, if he falls to the late, to the third or late or day three, give me Leonard Taylor, hand him over to Andre Patterson, stick him next to Dexter Lawrence between Kayvon Thibodeau and Brian Burns. I'm all for it. So I, I love that value. I agree with you. Um, linebacker position. I think the main guy that sticks out here is Peyton Wilston. He's the guy we've talked about playing. He's a great athlete. He ran a four four three, incredibly fast. And not only did he run a four three three, he was pissed off about it. He he wanted a four three. He wanted it the four threes, and he felt like he could do it. So, um, top top uh, forty yard dash of all linebackers. He still wasn't happy with it. Previn Wallace from Kentucky was a guy that we mentioned would have a really good day. You know, he he ran a four five one. Uh, so I mean, he's a you know lesser known prospect, and you know, for good reason he doesn't have a ton of production. But he also jumped thirty seven and a half inches, ten seven broad jump, like very very good athlete, a guy you can take a a gamble on. As far as you know, 
fallers. I didn't I didn't really think there was any notice like notable names that I felt were fallers, but um you any any opinions on any of that? Wilson's gonna be a faller. Wilson's medicals apparently were horrific. That's not great. Uh, they were bad. And that means he's going to drop. That's a you can see him sliding on day two. Um maybe into day three. You know, you never know with these medical things. So his medicals are apparently very bad. I don't know if the Giants would take him, but depending on how why they're bad, that's the kind of guy that could be value if he gets to day three. So watch for Peyton Wilson to slide. But that was yep. about it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, cornerbacks. I'll I'll give you some. I mean, Nate Wiggins, four two eight, uh, four four day dash, incredibly impressive. Qu- Quinnian Mitchell, a four a four three three, again, ridiculously impressive. Um, Max Melton, a guy we've been talking about a lot. Four three nine, and, and yeah. that, it was it wasn't even just that. Max Melton blew up the combine. Um, forty and a half inch vertical jump, eleven eleven feet four inches. That tied By- Byron Jones' record for a longest broad jump in in combine history. A one five one ten yard split. He's a guy we've talked about getting day three. I think he's playing himself into day two at the he's, very least a, a, comp, he, a compensation pick. Yeah, he's he's going in the top 100, almost certainly. So, yeah, yeah. So you know, shout out Max Melton. Good for him. I you know I have still like him. I probably would still wait to fourth round, but you know if he's there. But you know, good, I, I mean, he he played good football against good competition. Uh, and mm-hmm. If you test like that and you have that tape against guys like Marvin Harrison Jr. and you have a good you know? coach like uh like we do at at, at DVAC with Rome Her- uh, Henderson. Don't be surprised if we like him. Yeah. Yeah. He's he's a local kid. Um, you know, I will say as far as fallers go, um, I think there's there's a couple here. I think the biggest one, the faller of all fallers. He's been falling, he's been falling for all year, but you think he freshly bottomed out. Kalen King ran a four six one. Wow. Should should have went back to school. He's done. He's he's, he's, gonna, he, he's a he's a UDFA. He's on the Eli Eli Ricks uh, trajectory, and he's, I he's, I think he I'll might be, be worse. I'll be shocked if he's not a UDFA at this point. Like I'll be really surprised if somebody spends a draft pick on him. He's been just collapsing. This kid should have gone back to school. He had two years of eligibility left. I don't know what he was thinking. Um, the the other one I'll say, um, I don't think he had a bad day. I'm not saying this guy had a bad day, but in comparison, Terry and Arnold. He, he ran a flat four five. I mean, he did have a thirty seven inch vertical, ten nine broad jump. He did well. He had good numbers. He's a good athlete. But for a guy who was getting pushed up as cornerback one because of how good of an athlete he was, he's also a very good player. But to me, with how well Quinion Mitchell did, with how productive he is, how well he killed the Senior Bowl, and being that much better of an athlete to him, in me, it's there's no argument anymore. Quinion Mitchell's my cornerback one. He, I agree. Um, I still think there's a great case that Terry Arnold's cornerback too. I think Nate Wiggins is making his case depending on your scheme. But um, I uh, I will go ahead and say that he he fell. He definitely took a hit. Um, uh, so any any other comments on any of that? No, no. I think okay. we went over it. Last position group here then. Um, safety. Um, I'm trying trying to point out and see if anybody really yeah sticks can't. Out. Well, I can tell you who didn't stick out. We'll get to him. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, you t- talk about him because I don't really yeah. see anybody. Yeah, there, there was no safety that stood out as a great tester, like above what they thought they would. Cam Kitchens from Miami, who started the year as our safety one, had a good year. Not a great year, but a good year after having a great year in 2022, playing every role on that Miami defense at safety. Had an awful combine. Just terrible. He tested, I think he ran a 4-6-2 or something like that. I mean, he had a terrible 10-yard split. Just bad numbers all around. Looked a lot like Xavier McKinney's numbers, which caused him to fall. Now, McKinney was supposedly hurt on the day of his combine, but still, you know, Kinchins' stock is falling. I will say this about Cam Kinchins. He's a very good football player, and we could use a safety. Safeties, it's not about, it's not about athletic testing for these guys. It's nice if they're good athletes, what what their strength has to be is up here. They're quarterbacks on defense. They have to be quick processors. They have to be instinctive. 
They have to get to the ball quickly. They are not guys that you're going to get a good grasp of looking at their RAS composite scores. Look at their film and see, do they have good instincts? Do they know where to get to with it? You know, do they, do they break on the ball quickly? Can they read the defense? I mean, can they read the offense very well and make plays? He does all of those things. And he's a very good tackler. Kitchens is falling. I, I see Kevin asking, can he be a third rounder? I, I think he's fall. He might be out of the third round. You know, I already thought he might be a third rounder before this. He's going to get a bad year. So he's a guy that, again, another value pick you could add to the list of value picks the Giants could take a swing at. I kind of want picks in that range now, in that third, fourth range. Like, I, you know, trade like, down. yeah, you could trade down, you could find a way to get him. But like, Kitchens is a guy, like, I think if you bring in, I think if, if Kitchens falls, like, I think he will, and the Giants took him, I think he'd be a perfect plug in for Xavier McKinney. Is he going to be as good as McKinney right away? No, nobody's going to be as good as McKinney right away. But he has the potential to be as good as Xavier McKinney. And I don't care about the stupid athletic testing. That's a good football player. I, I agree with you. He, you know, he had a bad year, which hurts, and that. But that that worries me. It wasn't, me even, a, it wasn't even a bad year. It was just a good year. It a wasn't down a great year. year. Relative too many to gambles and things like that. Relative to an elite year, he had a down year, and the way that defense was run was somewhat questionable. Um, so I would take a swing on him. But anyway, that yeah, that was I, one guy I, that stood out. I, I agree with you. Yeah, I mean, yeah, four six five, one five nine, ten, uh, ten yard split, thirty five inch vertical, um, nine two, uh, nine feet two inch broad jump, really, really bad. But outside of all that, that's very Xavier McKinney, especially five eleven, two hundred three pounds, like very, very similar. Like you said, the injury is there, but um, yeah, I I think uh, I think Kim Kitchens certainly hurt himself, but is a guy I'm still interested. I'm sorry. There was a one one riser, and it was actually somebody who brought. I think we brought up. I knew somebody I knew was going to take off. Tyler Owens from Texas Tech. He was a guy who was supposed to blow up. He was a guy that many people thought was the best chance to run the best forty at the at the combine. He didn't end up running the forty yard dash, but what he did, why I forgot about what he did do though, is he did jump, and man, did he jump. 41 inches on the vertical jump, and I I, I I misspoke. It wasn't Max Melton who tied Byron Jones' record. I remembered somebody did, but it wasn't him. It was Tyler Owens. 12 feet, 2 inches in his broad jump. And this was a guy who was supposed to run in the four twos. So, yeah, Tyler Owens is, is going to get interest. That's that's a guy that I knew was supposed to yeah. do well, but again, we, but somebody who I haven't him. done a ton of looking. Yeah, he's added to the list of guys like, you know, the kid from Louisville that we have to go back and watch tape on and see does it match. Yep. So that, that that's all, everybody. That's that's our free agents review, our makeup episode for our combine review. We went through it all, Sal. That's a lot. We went through everybody again, uh, <laughs> yeah. but but uh, we appreciate you guys being uh, patient. I'm actually just looking at something real quick. Yeah, Owens's production doesn't match at all. Uh, but in any case, um, that's an episode. We went through obviously the Giants for agency stuff and the and the combine review. We it's been a long episode, but we do long episodes. So our loyal fans, you guys are always patient with us. We appreciate it. I know we were I was gone for a week, so we kind of made up a little bit today. We have a lot of full stuff coming up, a lot of fun stuff coming up. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Kevin. Everybody who's here, DK, whoever is still in the chat. All our regulars, everybody. Oh, yes. Thank you, guys. Appreciate you. Please remember to like and subscribe us at He's a Giant Pod on Twitter. You can find and uh, you can find me at, at Queens underscore God Monty at Monte Cristo M O N T E C R I five T O. Um, you know we're on all the major platforms: YouTube, Apple, Spotify. Uh, we got a bunch of stuff coming up. Um, we're going to be creating a big board pretty soon. We'll fill you in on that. Uh, and we have some other episodes going into the offseason, getting ready for the crunch time leading up to the NFL draft. Any closing thoughts, Monty? Um, nope. Uh, just it was a good episode. Good going over this after a week off and not getting together. So, uh, yeah, man, uh, it's exciting time. Lot, lots of football going on. It's a, it's a new Giants it looks like we're looking forward to moving forward. So it's a great Happy. time to be a giant. Absolutely. And I, I really believe I'll, I'll close with this. This week is the first time I have felt in a very long time. Like the giants are finally doing good things, like really good things. Like they finally turned the page on a decade of insanity. And they're finally seeing clearly through the clouds. 
and they are making good decisions. And I have more faith now than I've had in a very long time that whatever they do, I think they're heading in the right direction. So with that, we'll see you guys next week. Go Giants. Go Giants.